we present Whose Line Is It Anyway? And here's your chairman, Clive Anderson. Right, hello and welcome to Whose Line Is It Anyway? A programme of skilful improvisation, spontaneous wit, off-the-cuff wisdom and an introduction that's going to take some living up to. And now, on a, as on any good radio panel game, and indeed on any bad one as well, we have four contestants. We have here tonight John Sessions, an actor and comedian frequently cast in TV, films and plays and always cast in his own one-man show. Stephen Fry, who was recently described as a Renaissance man by somebody with a very poor grasp of which century we're living in. <laughs> And Dawn French, one half of French and, Let French and Saunders. She, <laughs> she is, of course, otherwise known as Mrs. Lenny Henry. And we also have Lenny Henry, otherwise known as uh, Mrs. Lenny Henry. <laughs> now, this program is all about improvisation. We've got a number of games to play. So why don't we play the first one? Well, why indeed? So the first one is, in fact, called Authors. Uh, each contestant is going to come along with the name of an author. They're just busy working out names of authors now. And... Uh, one of them, in the style of his or her author, Stephen, will start a story and uh, the others will continue as I uh, signal them to carry on by using this buzzer, which makes this noise. But the story they do will be coming from suggestions from our studio audience. So, has anyone got a suggestion for the name of a story? It can be something quite simple. Bison. <laughs> well, I think it was bison. Or, bison? You know, wash hand bison, something like that. <laughs> So, yeah. Charles, the, Burning. Charles Burney. Big cars burning. Big cars burning. Big cars burning. Yes. Can okay. we have some big sense? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. We're starting off with the easy ones for you. Right. <laughs> big car, a story about big cars burning. Could you wrap that round some sort yes. of a story? Yes. And uh, let's find out what your authors are. Well, it was Stephen... going to be P.G. Woodhouse. P.G. Is... Woodhouse. Yes. It's going to be. Well, I Is yes. it still going to be? Good. Yeah, it'll have to be. Uh, so that's uh, Stephen's author, Dawn. Um, Claire Rayner, my heroine. <laughs> Lenny? Uh, I'll do uh, Stephen King, the horror. <laughs> <laughs> and John, John Sessions. Um, D.H. Lawrence. D.H. Lawrence, right, so... <laughs> He's a bit of a swat, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But uh, which bit, we're wondering. Now, uh, the... <laughs> So, can we remember what the story was? Oh, yes, big, big cars burning. Thanks a lot, pal. From the rather way. irritating... <laughs> we'll get you later. So, take it away, Stephen, in the style of P.G. Wodehouse. I woke one morning and Jeeves shimmered in with the old pick-me-up uh, and told me that Aunt Dahlia had been on the telephone telling me to come down at once in the Hispano Suiza uh, to her little place in Shropshire just outside Market Snodsbury. <laughs> And, of course, if you find yourself on top of a big car burning, um, my advice would be to uh, make sure you check your age and uh, do it carefully with a condom. <laughs> As he opened the car door, a claw came out and ripped his face off. He couldn't even find his car keys. He just reached and reached. It wouldn't start. Suddenly a demon appeared on the bonnet. Hello? <laughs> Tom and Anna Brangwen held each other's bodies closer, closer, wrapping in foliage round each other, diving, thrusting, lower, biting. Plume serpents rose, driving, fiendish, unfortunate, really. They were in a Chevy Nova going over a cliff. I say, steady on, old scream. <laughs> I say, Jeeves, um, do you smell something rather peculiar? Are you sure you're old enough to smell that? Are you sure? <laughs> I think you should check that you both love each other. <laughs> and I think you should check that your dangly bits are the same size. Everything was dangling from the car. <laughs> the car was rotating, rolling, pounding down the cliff. <laughs> And still their bodies were entwined like old-fashioned pottery, leaping like snakes around each other. 
No, I, I said a stiff martini, Jeeves. A stiff martini. Mar when, I, when I say stiff, I think we all know what that means. <laughs> Suddenly, flame erupted from the engine and the big car was burning. Our hero didn't know what to do and so he shut up. <laughs> Jeffrey Archer suddenly pushed D.H. Lawrence out of the way. Notice that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have to award points for the performances there. I'll give you all five points each, but for one off from John Sessions down to four for mentioning Jeffrey Archer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't realise you were in tonight, sir. Uh, <laughs> Right then, let's try another game then. Uh, this is a good one. It's called Wrong Theme Tune. Uh, it's called this because the wrong theme tune is played. Now, each uh, pair... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dawn and Lenny are going to be uh, acting out a scene from the Money programme, but they're going to do it based on this theme tune. A house <laughs> with a door. One... Ready to play? What's the day? It's Thursday. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Today, Big Ted has got his little piggy. What does he keep in his piggy? In it? <laughs> no. No money. His little pennies. Can you spell that? Money. <laughs> yes. Let's go through the round window. <laughs> These are some men pulling a bank job. <laughs> They're you... making money. <laughs> Can you say Brinks Matt Bullion. <laughs> Big Ted says crime does pay. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, then, on that anarchic note, I think ten points each. So let's uh, zoom over now to John and Stephen who are going to be covering the state opening of Parliament, a sort of TV special, but in the line of this theme tune. Good day. Welcome. Welcome. And uh, it's really quite an extraordinary day. It reminds me of a marriage about 400 years ago between Dodd Bradman and Harold Sweetman, wasn't it? That's right, yes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful day for it. In fact, it's been raining all morning, but the uh, <laughs> covers have just been taken off the Lords. I'm slightly... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Slightly confused by the, the colours of the costumes. Usually uh, the chaps are in white and today they're dressed in gold and scarlet. Very yeah. attractive sight indeed. And uh, the Queen now, she's gone in and she's started now and uh, she's speaking clearly and firmly. What a marvellous delivery. Oh, no, she has <laughs> um, But she's pulled the bales out now. She's running, running, panting. My word, that shirt is open to the waist. Reminds me of Harold Larwood back in 1932. And she's done a beautiful googly straight up towards Black Rod now. It's bounced straight into his googlies. Back again, it's whirling down, down now towards Lord Chumley. Quite extraordinary sight this uh, here at Lord's. Um, this has been going on now for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, and still no decision has been made. <laughs> Yes, that was magnificent. We <laughs> could have listened to that all night. Certainly, it seems we were going to. Now, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I'll have to give eight points each there for a spectacular performance, uh, state opening of Parliament. Now, we'll go on to every other line. This, this is a reasonably complicated game. Working in pairs again, and we'll start off with Lenny and John uh, working in a pair. One person, and in this case it's John, has the script of a play. It's a real play. It's been written in advance for us by Oscar Wilde. Uh, it's called uh, Lady Windermere's Fan. Uh, he'll be reading the lines from that, but Lenny won't be. He'll be acting his own scene to go along with it. Does that make any sense? 
And uh, the scene he'll be acting is um, trying to tell a mafia boss that he's just killed his daughter. <laughs> but... OK. <laughs> and uh, what I'd like, if, if it was from the audience, is a last line to that scene for Lenny to be working towards. So if you've got a nice snappy last line, anybody you can think of? Oh, no, not again. <laughs> That's good. Oh, no, not again. <laughs> okay. Well, there we are. <laughs> As it is a good job, after all, that Geoffrey Archer was in. So let's. Uh... Okay. Thank you, Geoffrey. Yeah. So, uh, so if you were to start off, Lenny, and then uh, okay. John will come in with his lines. Godfather, I show you a lot of respect. Don't you want the world to take you seriously, then, Lord Darlington? <laughs> <laughs> Godfather, I kiss your ring. Oh, well, we all want friends at times. <laughs> Godfather, me and Vito went to the mattresses yesterday and... You think I'm a Puritan, I suppose? Well, it could be bad news for you in that... <laughs> My dear Lady Windermere. <laughs> you God... think the age very bad? We, we shot Shirley. Well, put it there, Parker. That'll do. <laughs> we shot Shirley, your daughter, Godfather. Ah. Well, nowadays, we're all of us so hard up that the only pleasant thing is to pay our compliments. <laughs> <laughs> and Sonny said, oh, no, not again. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> what is this? You've got the wrong <laughs> Well, I think John gets uh, five points there for a brilliant reading and for a skillful working towards the last line there without a shadow of a join. Uh, no points to Lenny. So... <laughs> All right, now let's uh, change around. Obviously now Stephen and Dawn. Dawn will be doing the reading and Stephen will be doing the acting. Dawn is going to be reading from A Lady Orderly's Secret by C.H. Hazelwood. I'm sure you've all read that before coming here this evening. <laughs> so you can check we're not cheating. And uh, this is a job interview. So if you're, you're acting out a job interview, yes, and uh, the audience is going to give us a last line. Personal That's all you get, personal services. OK, go ahead. Um, yes, w what makes you think that you're qualified for this job, exactly? Indeed. And did he tell you why I was coming? <laughs> no, no, well, you, you wrote a letter yourself asking if you could have the job. For what? Well, uh, as I understood it, for installing poppet valves. <laughs> And where is your husband now? I, I think we may have one or two crossed lines here, um, Mrs. Dalvaney. Um, I, I, I'm looking for someone to install poppet valves into my new system. Robert Audley is bent on... <laughs> yes, well, that's why we sacked him. Uh, uh, Not a, not a matter of prejudice, just, just a matter of convenience. No, was... no, it's getting late. Yes, that's right. I mean, I've got six other people to see, so... Um... No, no, not tonight. I can't sleep without it. It's my nightcap. Ah, I see what you're driving at now. You, uh, you want me to provide something extra, don't you? Send your husband to me. Yes, I thought so. <laughs> Personal services, yes. Mm, ish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, again, I think Dawn French deserves a good five points there for the reading, and uh, you almost got to the uh, the line there, Stephen. Mm -hmm. So maybe one mark off. Yes. No. Okay. No. Give one one mark on. One mark on. Yes. Very good. <laughs> I'm just making these numbers off off the top of my head. But can we re return to Stephen and John uh, to do another game now, where I think you two are going to be playing two favourite characters and you're going to be rambling on in those characters with a topic from the audience. What, what are your two characters? Um, I'm, I'm Professor Hugh Trevor Morton from uh, Queen's College, Cambridge. Oh, yes, and, and I'm not. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm another professor from another college altogether. And, well, they are, and so two we professors. are both professors of, of English literature. And uh, what, what would you like the two professors Break to talk? Basins. What? <laughs> Basins? What was the other one? Baked beans or what? Baked beans. All right. You've got a choice here. You can either do baked beans or, or baked beans. Oh, wild west wind. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. 
Is this Bell, silly, thou it? never worked. Yes. Uh, yes. I have ten more. And then I... No. It doesn't rhyme, does it? No. <laughs> no. Then lost. you always had a kind of deafness, Shelley, yes. when it came to the rhyme. I remember there was one of his... Do you remember? Uh, on uh, the discovery of America. Well, Thomas Medchip to the Harry in Greek because, you see, he was using it all the time, you see. That's right. The Harricot bean, the Harricot bean. The Harricot bean, bean, the Harricot bean, the Harricot bean, an ipso facto, no. you have been. Yes, yes that's right. Yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. A kind of uh, self-involved, reflexive, philosophical proof. Absolutely. Yes, totally that's axiomatic right. to the fact that if you have a baked bean tin, you are, as it were, a punt. That's right. And, uh... <laughs> Yes. And I remember, um, dear Thackeray was saying in Modern Linguistics the other day that, of course, Thunos yes. and Banos, yes. Uh, yes. as in Heinz and Beans, refer both back to the sun god of Assyria. Yes. And at the same time, <laughs> to <laughs> the um, Scandinavian god of flatulence. The good yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Are we going to run the Let's go on with uh, your two characters. Now, what are your characters? Uh, this is Wayne. Yes. <laughs> and this is Sharon. And um, they're pr on their first date. Yes, Wayne and Sharon on their first date. And what would they talk about? Wait. Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> I always said this would be done better without a studio audience. So. <laughs> And I think we're going to prove it now. So, uh, yes, OK, Wayne and Sharon, first date, talking about double glazing. So it's nice here, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> lovely, yeah. <laughs> nice windows. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think they're double glazed? Well, I don't know. They Have might you got be. a feather? No. Have you got a feather? No. <laughs> Have you got a feather? No. <laughs> Well, you could drop it down, see? Yeah? That's like that geezer used to do. And Who? Ted Moult. Who? Ted Moult. <laughs> Who? Drop the feather. <laughs> Ted Moult. <laughs> drop the feather. Yeah. And it detects any of the wind, you know. What? A, a, a feather? I said feather. <laughs> or an helicopter. <laughs> so, what, you put a feather? in the helicopter and, and then, then if it detects the wind it blows around proves you've got the double glazing you know and it's Ted Rogers is it that <laughs> what, what, what Ted Moult who Ted Moult <laughs> <laughs> well I definitely think 20 points all around there so well, now we will go on to improvising a rap this is a musical uh, item, obviously, when each of the uh, performers will <laughs> improvise a rap with the help of a drum beat. Have we got a drum beat coming along? And have we got to get a topic? Can't hear a word. Broth? Spiders. Spiders. How about animals? Spiders. How about, animal how about, how about <laughs> animals generally, if we've got uh, spiders? Animals. Do animals. We... Feel good. <laughs> I went to the zoo, walked down the street, opened the door, and guess who I should meet? A tiger came and bit off my leg, and now I'm gonna walk back home again. It's the animal rap. I like animals, I like Pekingese. I like them a lot, cos they're stupid knees. I like everything, I like a snake, and I don't if it's a fake. <laughs> Uh, um, oh, I find it rather hard to get to sleep, so I, I tend to spend my time counting sheep. Um, I've got uh, plenty in my bedroom, um, one on the walls, um, one in bed and one curled up on my lap. <laughs> I like a man from Uncle, like a man from Atlantis, but I like to make love to a praying mantis. Get down on your leg. Down on your feet and go after those sheep till they bleep, bleep, bleep. I said, dang. Oh, yeah. Feel good. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm enjoying this too. <laughs> I like to go hunting, there's no denying. I like to stick my gun into a big lion. I'd like to get down with a big fat sheep. I'd like to do something else and then go to sleep. <laughs> Of 
especially cats. I like them if they're thin. I like them if they're fat. I like other animals. I like a dog. But one thing I wouldn't do with a dog is snog. <laughs> I once went to bed with a baby llama, but it didn't matter because he didn't tell his mama. Uh, <laughs> Went to bed with a bird from Carolina, but it did matter because it was a minor. I think we can uh, wrap that one up there. And uh, so I think we'll give 15 points to everybody except uh, somebody I'm going to take against Stephen. Uh, give him only five. Now. We're now go, going to go on to a change of company, which doesn't mean that we're going to get rid of all four of you, though it's quite a good idea. Um, in fact, what the performers are going to do is to perform um, a story, and something nice and simple, and it's going to be, I think, uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. So they're going to perform that through, but at crucial points in it, we're going to change round the, the way they'll be doing it by changing round the people who are doing it. So, for example, a whole lot of dentists are performing Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Now, I don't know why that should be. So we'll start off with you performing it as though you were dentists. Any, any other suggestions? Football commentators. Football commentators, excellent. Anybody else? Beauticians. Beauticians, beauticians yes. Policemen. Policemen, very good one, yes. Nuns. Nuns, yes. Is that, is that, do you want a silent order or a not silent order? <laughs> Next time. Any, any others? Astronauts. Astronauts, that's another good one, I think. DJ is another one I had as a suggestion earlier on. Is this the full list we've got here? Right. I think, uh, Stephen, are you going to play Daddy Bear? And... <laughs> Don, I've got you penciled in as uh, Mummy Bear. And if John, if John, you could play Baby Bear. And Lenny, could you play Goldilocks? <laughs> Starting off, what do we say we we're going to start off with? We were going to start off with dentists, a rather different one just to begin with. Right. All right. Open wide. Well, that's the door. <laughs> and, um... OK, go on to policeman. All right, then, uh, what seems to be for breakfast, uh, Mrs Bear? <laughs> well, there's some... Uh, Another bedroom there's some... <laughs> <laughs> four, five, three, six. Come in, four, five, three, six. Come in. Come in. I've, uh, I've, de <laughs> I've detected some porridge, porridge. on the table. Porridge. Well, yes. we'll do our porridge, then. Oh, All right, that's what we'll do. This porridge is hot. <laughs> You're right, it is. I don't know who pinched it. <laughs> this is definitely... <laughs> I guess two cavemen getting onto this... Going Come, for a walk. let us leave the cottage. <laughs> <laughs> and rub oil into your bodies until you look like tandoori chickens. <laughs> OK, I think Goldilocks is about to arrive, and could we do it as astronauts? <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming into the house now. <laughs> this is one giant step for a girl with blonde hair and ribbons. <laughs> Let's just sit on this chair. Too hard. <laughs> Let's leap over to this one. Too soft. <laughs> Let's try this. <laughs> Zero gravity means that the chair is completely broken. <laughs> Let's try this porridge. Mm. I'll eat it all up. It's just right. And now to burn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think we should have the should have the bears coming back or thinking about it as football commentators. Um. First, well, the porridge should be completely cool by now. Well, it was a great bit of porridge when I went in the plate, uh, Derek, but... <laughs> and it came back again, it was just no way that mock was going to go all around it, you know? They, they it's were wonderful porridge, back. it's wonderful porridge, it's wonderful porridge! Just yes, there's no moment, porridge just left! Just a moment, it looks as if somebody... I couldn't tell quite who he was, I didn't have a chance to see him. It looks as if somebody has been tasting this porridge. Uh, it's a very good chance the porridge has been touched, and there's no way the boys can come back in that yeah, one. I don't, a little bit. <laughs> We should be about finding Goldilocks now as DJs. Right, and uh, 
with the time fast approaching coming rapidly up to. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, time to go into the bedroom, I think. Uh, so. Yes, that's a marvellous suggestion there from uh, Marjorie of Kingsbridge. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and can we end, end the story with as Australians? Waltzy Matilda, Waltzy Matilda. Truth, there's some kind of bed under my bed. <laughs> Forget that, let's have the lager. All right, guys, what's say we go downstairs and have some tucker? Why not? <laughs> That's a good idea. I never heard it spelt like that before. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking rigidly there to the story of three Goldilocks and the three bears, I think five points each. Now, let's... I think this is the last round, isn't it? Gosh, doesn't, doesn't time fly when... Uh, when you, <laughs> and uh, the last round, in fact, features me as a party host, uh, having a party, and uh, a succession of the worst possible people in the world are going to turn up to my party. And uh, as each one comes in, as soon as we've had a bit from them, the doorbell will go. It'll sound remarkably like my buzzer. So, if you're imagining me at a party, are we having some gentle, tinkly party music? Is somebody smoking in here? Um, because if they do, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not, it's just I'm allergic. If, if, if I, somebody smokes, I turn into a rented bigot, I'm afraid. Um... And, uh, sorry, Clive, sausages on sticks. You know I'm vegetarian. I'm offended by that, Clive, I'm offended. Uh, hello. Oh, I live over the road, I saw the lights and everything. Um, and I was just wondering, look, I got this can of lager, and I was wondering if it'd be alright if I came and, you know, hang out for a while, you know, cos uh, I like parties. <laughs> can I, um, can I just ask you how much you pay for this house? Cos it's not my sort of end of terrace, isn't it? In this area, see, I bought one about ten years ago. It's gone up now. Oh, it's gone up beautifully. Uh, I, I could sell mine now for 80,000, I paid only 40 for it. I remember a very good party I had, maybe. Ooh, ten years ago, and we got lots of um, uh, the Alexander Brothers playing, and maybe a bit of Moira Anderson. We'd sit around and have a good dance and a good chat. None of that sex or anything. You've got to come upstairs quick because Barry's been sick in the in the in the talk. <laughs> Honestly, size couldn't matter less. <laughs> it really isn't important. I don't know if you saw my last telly. Um, it was a marvellous, marvellous thing I did. Um, it was in Howard's Way. Um, I, I played a small yacht. Uh, I'm not sexist, but women, are, they're different. <laughs> you you want to do what to me? <laughs> I couldn't help noticing that uh, as I was coming up the path, that uh, you've got gladiolis in the front garden. And um, when I first met my wife, when we actually went out, I proposed to her. We had gladiolis on the table, isn't it something? I don't think we can cram any more of these hideous guests into my party. Uh, so that brings to an end this week's programme. Just uh, leaves me to give final points for that last round. And if I give five points each, that would uh, bring the scores up to what? Oh, very think exciting carefully. scoring think this. Think carefully, Clive, before you give the points. Oh, and it does very look as though... Very carefully. Very close, very, uh, very close. Carefully. All on low 70s, Lenny, John and Stephen. But Dawn wins it with 79 oh. points. <laughs> and I wasn't even... I wasn't even responsible for the scoring. It was Mark Leveson adding up the scores for us. And that completes our programme for tonight. So it's goodbye from all of us. Goodbye. <laughs> Whose line is it anyway? It featured Stephen Fry, John Sessions, Dawn French and Lenny Henry. And the chair was Clive Anderson. Colin Sell was at the piano and additional material was provided by Martin Booth. The show was devised and compiled by Mark Leveson with the producer Dan Patterson. Whose line is it anyway? And here's your chairman, Clive Anderson. Hello, hello, and welcome to Whose Line Is It Anyway? A radio panel game of spontaneity, improvisation, and a half an hour of undiluted panic. This week on the programme we have our regulars, Stephen Fry and John Sessions, the somewhat more irregular Hugh Laurie and the positively constipated N. Rytel. <laughs> 
Stephen Fry and John Sessions will need no introduction to anybody who knows them already. Hugh Laurie is Stephen Fry's partner on Saturday Live and a host of other comedy shows, so it's quite a coincidence he's turned up on this programme tonight. <laughs> N. Rytel, apart from appearing in Lucky Jim and for a long run in Me and My Girl, is often heard giving voice to the puppets on Spitting Image. The games that we're playing are very, very simple. I'll do my best to make them complicated for you. The first game is called Authors, and it's that name because all the contestants have come along with an author, a favourite author of theirs, and we'll be giving them a story to tell in the style of their author. So one contestant will start off telling the story in his author's style. When we get so far in, I'll make a sound like a buzzer, like that. And we'll go on to the next contestant with their author's style. So, Stephen Fry, which author have you decided to come along as? Well, Clive, I've chosen Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Conan the Barbarian, yes. <laughs> and uh, Hugh, Hugh Laurie? Uh, my choice is Enid Blyton. Enid Blyton. <laughs> Very good and popular choice there. I think some people have read it. And um, N, N, N. Rytel. Dashiell Hammett. But Dash I can't Hammett. Spell it. Sorry? I can't spell it. Well, I don't think that'll be necessarily part of the game, but uh, <laughs> you can try it if you want to as a bonus prize. Uh, I will be awarding points as we go along. And John Sessions, what's your author? Um, I'm the show-off. Mine's going to be Ernest Hemingway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, well, we're now going to get a story, so could somebody in the audience volunteer for us a story or a subject for them to tell uh, in the... War and Peace. War and Peace. Uh, this is a half-hour programme. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were... Is there something shorter we could do? Maybe just war or, or skir <laughs> skirmish and a kiss or something? No, I think, I think that's a little long. And, 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 and the election. I don't think that's what he said, actually, but the election. No. <laughs> well, he, I think he's a Chinaman, actually, but I don't... Could, could we have another, another... More like a subject of a story. Fish. Fish. And what was that other one there? I might combine the two. Seduction. Seduction of a fish. I think we'll try that. <laughs> Why not? Let's make it hard. You know, I've made it hard for... Uh, mm. <laughs> well, let's start off then doing seduction of a fish. <laughs> oh, yeah. Somebody must be on drugs. Anyway, we'll start... <laughs> starting then with Stephen in the character of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Right. The year 1887 saw many of the most spectacular cases that came before my good friend Sherlock Holmes, including the... Uh, Red Spider of Islington, for which the world is not yet prepared, uh, and the case of the severed knee, for which Holmes received the Order of the Silver Marmoset from the Cardinal Archbishop of Innsbruck. First class. I don't know where you get all these stories from, Lucy, said Edmund, parking, parking his machine against the hedge. Come along, you lot. Uh, Nick, Sarah, Sally, Dick, <laughs> Tallulah. <laughs> Let us proceed down this dusty lane, which is too dusty and too rough for our bicycles. How do you know that, said Lucy. Well, look... <laughs> look, I said to my partner, Miles. How could I tell him I was in love with his wife? He'd been married to a fish. Her name was Mrs. Mackerel. They'd been together... <laughs> They'd been together for 14 years. Nick looked at Mrs. Mackerel. She was sitting in the water. The water was deep. It was good. <laughs> As you looked into the water, the water went a long way down, and he wanted to marry the woman, but his father had told him never to marry the woman because the woman was a fish. And when you see a fish, you're meant to catch it. The old man of the sea, spinning up in the air she was, like a marlin, but she didn't stay a marlin. Oh, Holmes! I ejaculated. <laughs> uh, there! In the water! That fish! Ah, yes, said Holmes, puffing quietly on his cherry briar. That fish may be at the bottom of this whole mystery. Can you explain these feelings, Edmund? How old are you, Lucy? said Edmund. Well, I'm, I'll be 12 next January. 12, my word, that's early. <laughs> it was pretty early, but I figured 7 o'clock was a good time to eat. <laughs> we were sitting in a restaurant, Mrs. Mackerel and I. I. I wanted to tell her I loved her, but she was the main course. <laughs> I 
But after she was the main course, she went on to become the course fishing main. <laughs> See, was... Thank you. I think uh, ten points each there, but with a bonus five for uh, Stephen. Uh, we've got to keep this score very carefully. Now, the next game is called Genre Option. Now, we'll be working in pairs, or the contestants will be working in pairs. They'll be, I'll be giving them a setting of a scene, and they will be improvising on that scene. At any point, I'll stop them by using the buzzer, and I'll ask you, the members of the audience in the studio here, to call out a different style, a different genre, for them to, to do it in. Okay? Bless you whoever just sneezed. <laughs> so, first of all, I'd like uh, Stephen Fry and N. Rytel, if you were acting together, acting out the scene of a policeman discovering a burglar. Ho! Ho, 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 ho. I've oh, discovered you something, Johnson. You see this, uh, you see this med medicine cabinet in here? Um, can we just get this straight just for a second? I don't want to be embarrassing here, but one of us has got to be a burglar. <laughs> said two policemen discovering a burglar. No, 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 no. no. I'll, I'll say that again slowly. I don't want to be... End. Okay, okay. I'll go I don't want to be picky. One of you plays a policeman, the other is happening upon a burglar. The burglar will be paid by the other person. Yes, I've got that now. I've got that now. It's pretty it's straightforward. difficult, though. Okay. Ho! Oh. Uh, what? What are you doing there? Where? In this house. Oh! This house? Well, I heard the phone ringing and I could see nobody lived here. <laughs> so I thought I'd answer the phone uh, to see, uh, you know, if it was an urgent message or... Uh, and a style, please? A genre? Dance. Western. Cartoon. Horror. Horror. <laughs> well, well, horror. Let's, let's go for horror. I like, I like the horror one there. We've got horror. And I'm standing here. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, as soon as I got to the phone, it stopped. <laughs> I felt a little hungry. I'd walked all the way from Dunstable. <laughs> Dunstable? Did you say Dunstable or Constable? <laughs> Dunstable? Is that your name? That is my name, sir. Well, Constable Dunstable. <laughs> Another star? Musical, Saturday Grandstand. Oh, Saturday Grandstand, that sounds uh, an interesting <laughs> one. Not Sunday Grandstand, mind. Any references to the Lord's Day will be ruled out. Okay, Saturday Grandstand. And we are moving now! <laughs> Straight away, right over to David in the studio. Uh, well, it's absolutely amazing here because I found uh, 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 in the uh, in the cupboard I found some uh, silver. This is absolutely fantastic silver. Uh, I've never actually seen silver like this in my life Another before. Star. It's incredible. Uh, Shakespeare, I've got political broadcast Shakespeare, so can you do a Shakespeare political broadcast? How canst thou thus for shame, paltry man, here on this space in this point? These articles, which my father sometime did give to me, thus purloin. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much. I feel you've had your say there. <laughs> Shakespearean question time, though. Um, and, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. OK, um, I think that's worth 12 points each, with a deduction to end of five points for going off one of the genres there, the definite swing into question time, which I don't think was well, asked for. it was for. political burglary. It was, it was political oh, I see. I'm sorry. That's a, that's a bonus five points. I'm so sorry. A bonus five points. <laughs> You're quite right. Uh, um, now we switch, obviously, to John Sessions and Hugh Laurie, and uh, the scene we'd like you to enact, if at all possible, would be a customer complaining to a waiter. And we want some genres to play in, preferably film genres, film styles. So, Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind, wind. wind. sounds quite a good one. <laughs> I always bring my wife here to dinner, and I sat down here, and frankly, my dear, I don't care for flan. <laughs> Something like that. Another one, quickly. <laughs> carry on, carry on films, yes. <laughs> I said I wanted a big one. And the one you brought me here, well, it's not exactly big, is it? Huh? <laughs> I tell you, your time of life, it's a bloody miracle. <laughs> well, I tell you what, when I come out of the kitchen and get me a nice French stick, then I can put it up, can't I? <laughs> oh, she's got a big pear over there, isn't she? What if she's going to eat it? 
Another one. <laughs> Another one there. Sorry? Bogart. Bogart. Humphrey Bogart, I, I take it you mean? Yes. <laughs> it could be Dirk Bogart, couldn't it? I mean, Humphrey Bogart. What is it? Is there a problem with the flam? What is it? Nothing. I'm just in Venice and I'm dying. <laughs> Another one. Batman. Sorry? Batman. Uh, well, we better settle for Batman then, since that, came, <laughs> since that came first. I was... Yeah, go ahead. I understood that you did demi chefing at the table. <laughs> do you not? Do demi chefing at the table? <laughs> or Holy do you? Holy flambéed flan, Batman. <laughs> it's all a question, Commissioner, of whether the soup will come before the main course, or whether the main course will come... That's it, of course. Poor misguided child. <laughs> We'll finish on that one, and I think 15 points each there for Hugh and John. So we're now racing along to the next game, which is called Wrong Theme Tune. This is because, again, acting in pairs, they're given a television programme to enact, but enacting it in the style of the theme tune that's played to them, and it's obviously the wrong theme tune. And uh, they don't know what theme tune's coming, but acting together, Stephen and Hugh... Could you do a sort of open university program on splitting the atom? <laughs> Got the hang of that? Yes. Uh, but do it in the style of this theme tune. Well, we've had uh, a fascinating letter from J.G. Ballard of Wolverhampton. <laughs> Who says, I've got a couple of atoms, which I'm quite interested in splitting. I, uh, but I've been having a lot of trouble getting people to split them. The so we said, really? <laughs> and he said, yes, really, can't you read? I said, yes. So, first of all, I went to Atom Splitters, Inc. They weren't in. <laughs> So then we tried the managing director. Sorry, he's on holiday. <laughs> His secretary is dead. <laughs> so we began to wonder, does this company really exist? No. <laughs> if you want atoms splitted, our advice is... Go to the professionals. Ask the BBC to do it for you. <laughs> Cyril. <laughs> Well, now, uh, I think we have to award points there, and I think that was worth uh, 15 points each. Very, very good performance there. The next, uh, the next pair, obviously, is John and N. And could you act out a scene from Star Trek, the famous American TV series and now films, act out a scene from that in the style of this theme tune? I'd like a divorce, Captain. Oh, I, I don't think so, Shell. It's not going to work in this galaxy. No chance of it. I'm having a lot of trouble with my willy, Captain, my little willy. I know, but the thing is, Shell, if we stay in Venus, we'll have to wear those tight blue suits with the silly collars. They're called it Klingons, aren't they? <laughs> well, that is one of the side effects, yes. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, <laughs> 15 points there to John and um, two points to N. Rytel for early use of woolly jokes. Which, uh... Now, the next game is called Every Other Line and... Uh, Acting in pairs again, we've got this time John Sessions and Hugh Laurie acting together. And um, yep. this time, one of the partnership will be improvising a scene, and the other will be reading every other line from a play that's been written in advance. It's the play that <laughs> Hugh will be reading from every other line is The Ticket of Leave Man by Tom Taylor. And uh, we're going to give them good. a scene uh, to improvise. So John is improvising a scene of a bank manager... Uh, interviewing somebody who's come to ask uh, about his overdraft. Yeah. But to give them an aim, a point to aim at, can we have a last line that would cap that scene from somebody in the audience? 
last line to a bank manager and somebody with an overdraft. Some of you must have been through this experience before. Get up off your knees. <laughs> Get up off your knees. Very good. I think that's the last line rather yeah. than an instruction to me. I was getting desperate there. Uh, so, so, get up off your knees right. is the last line. Starting off with John, improvising your scene and aiming towards that last line. I'm not a mendicant, Mr. Sirencester, and I'd like to help you, but there's just the problem of the money you have and any collateral you have at the moment. I mean, have you got any? I suppose this is Robert. <laughs> Well, Robert is a name we could possibly give to your collateral. I don't know if you call your... I don't know if you call your house Robert. I mean, I know someone who calls it his garage Montmorency, but he's very peculiar. But now you've got your discharge... <laughs> she'll have a protector. I don't think my wife's accident has got anything to do with this. Well, what do you mean to do? It's not a question of what I'm going to do, it's what you're going to do, and that is to provide me with some collateral. Then I can say, yes, you may have an overdraft. Tolerably good, sir. <laughs> I wouldn't say tolerably good, I said it was excellent. Well, hello, Granny. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say dramatic, get up off your knees. Thank you very much. And for that elegant slide into the final line, I think 20 points each there. So the next pairing, obviously Stephen and N. Uh, N. Wright, I'll be reading every other line from The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. And um, Stephen will be improvising the scene of a junior sort of officer trying to speak to the general while the battle is going rather badly and trying to get some instructions about what to do, go forward, go back, something like that. Right. In improvising a panic in a battle scene. And again, could we have a, an end line? for that to finish on. Get that wet thing out of my ear. <laughs> that was brilliant, that was brilliant. What do you think? Get that wet thing out of my ear. <laughs> this this just... man has been causing trouble. Yes, he has, be. yes. We're just, uh, <laughs> mind you, the person thing. sitting next to him obviously has as well, but the... Uh... <laughs> we, we just have to check if that line is out of copyright, and... <laughs> Have you been dead for 50 years? <laughs> you will be soon. Now, uh, OK, so we're aiming right. towards that punchline. Uh, get that wet thing out of my ear. You're reading for importance of being earnest, and uh, you're improvising right. that scene. And go ahead. Uh, sir, sir, it's Pomkiss here. Uh, Royal Signals. Sir, well, sir, we're here at the... Fr uh, there are a lot of shells whizzing about, sir. I really need some pretty clear commands. How are you, my dear Ernest? <laughs> Well, uh, it's what fine, sir. To town? Uh, well, uh, the situation is pretty hard to read at the moment, actually, sir. There's a lot of smoke, a lot of smell of cordite. Uh, can you advise? Well, what on earth do you do there? Well, what we're trying to do, we're trying to cut Jerry off, sir. Uh, <laughs> there's one thing I like better than getting stuck into the Jerry, it's having a good go at the Germans. Oh. <laughs> Got nice neighbours in your part of Shropshire? <laughs> uh, can we... Can we cover that at a later date, do you think, sir? Uh, more urgent sort of pressing requirements at the moment, vis-à-vis -vis escape from this uh, rather unfortunate contretemps. How utterly unromantic you are. <laughs> yes, sorry, I'm getting trouble from the Sergeant Major here. I, I'm very, finding it very hard to hear you. I'm going to have to put this, uh, the, the earpiece up. Look, sir, can we have some advice, please? Yes, I'm in love with Gwendolyn. <laughs> yes, so, Sergeant Major, would you get that wet thing out of my ear? Well, a work of genius there, and I'll give it to five points each. <laughs> now, the next game is called Party Pieces. And uh, this is basically what it says. You're all going to bring along their party pieces, in the sense that Hugh and Stephen have uh, worked together on many a comedy show and advertisement. And uh, <laughs> what, we'd like, what we'd like them to do <laughs> is to bring along a couple of their characters, which is the sort of salesman type at a conference and uh, just sort of enact out what these salesmen might be saying just before the conference is to begin. But the conference will be about selling a particular product, and can we have a suggestion of what that product may be? Chickens, Chickens, Chickens or... Self-raising flour. Chickens or self-raising flour? <laughs> Which of those? Self-raising flour, I think, is the most Self, exciting. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> we, could have, we could have bags of fun with that, so... Uh, get, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Right, ladies and gentlemen, I want to show you some really rather remarkable flower here. You've probably seen flower before. You probably think you know what it is. There's something rather special about this flower. Would you like to tell them, Stuart? Take it away, well, you I, uh, First of all... 
Uh, thank you, old tiger beetle. Um, no, listen, uh, first of all, I'd like to know how many people here are accustomed to raising their own flower. Um, is that a common experience? I mean, it must happen to you. I you see have one to... or two hands yeah, going I up think at the moment. Uh, yeah, yeah. I see heads nodding. Yeah. Um, I see parts of people's bodies nodding there. Um, <laughs> so, raising flower, it's a common enough experience. Oh, what a drag it is. Do we not all agree on that? Yeah? Raising flower. Yeah. Well, so you, maybe you're looking for something a little more automated, a little more um, responsive. It's dream fulfillment, if you like. Uh, That's right. Like now, this flower, before you ask any questions, it doesn't come from Japan. <laughs> No. My word, no. Uh, no, no, no. Though, though to say that it comes from the East might be rather appropriate because no. uh, <laughs> East has something to do with it. Oh, my word. I've, I've long admired your communication skills. I really have. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. I've always said a little bit of irony, a little bit of joking uh, pushes the sail a little bit further along. Mm. This flower raises itself, ladies and gentlemen. There's no question about that. I've got a bag down on here. Uh, if we're very quiet, uh, if we change the lights, uh, we should be able to see. Uh, you're standing on the string. Oh, uh, <laughs> this flower is about to... Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think you're going to believe what you're going to see. You're going to want one of these. Uh, it's just... Look at it. It's raising. It's going up in the air now. Look at that. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you want one of these for your Christmas uh, gift-giving ideas. Yeah, for heaven's sake, get, get your name down because these babies are going fast. I mean fast. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, OK. All right. Well, another five points each there. Uh, now, the next party piece uh, will be between N and John. Well, they've sort of worked together because they've both worked together on Spitting Image, doing uh, lots of different voices there. So what we thought we'd do is give them a, a situation to act out and then get you to suggest the, the voices that they might do. So the scene we thought out for them would be for Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson discovering a dead body, that sort of scene. Uh, but uh, really quite unlikely people could be playing the part. So have you got any sort of famous voices that they could do? Prince Charles. Prince Charles, yes, I think. Laurence Olivier! Laurence Olivier! Hang on, that, I rather like Prince Charles and Frankie Howard, which we... <laughs> no, no, I'm not getting a lot of... Uh, sorry? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Laurence Olivier. Ronald Reagan and then Laurence Olivier. You, you know, watch now, I, I find it rather strange that... Uh, <laughs> that there's this dead, dead, dead body here in, uh, <clears throat> here in my front room. The body is dead because Petty Rutland killed it? <laughs> well, I, I can't think how that happened at all. It's a, it's a strange phenomenon. It's quite simple. The only reason the body's lying there is because dear Mickey Kane and I were doing a film together called Sleuth. And I left it there on the floor deliberately so you could come in and look at it. <laughs> Did you say Mickey Mouse? No, no. You look a bit like Mickey Mouse yourself, don't you? Oh, no, this is a deer stalker. It's not a, it's not a proper hat. It looks a very cheap stalker to me. Oh. <laughs> well, that's... That is... Let, let's end on that weak pun on that part of the round. And definitely uh, 20 points each there for those two. And uh, now we'll go along to a very popular game, I should imagine. And it's called Improvising a Rap. You know, people do raps, they just make things up as they go along. Well, that's what we're asking these uh, contestants to do. And obviously with a topic or a subject, a nice broad subject if you could give them, for them to rap on. Don't make it specific, like, you know... Citrus fruit. Citrus fruit. <laughs> <laughs> OK, OK, I think citrus fruit is fine. I think I'm prepared to accept any sort of fruit. Now, what we have for that is a fantastic BBC sound effect of a drum beat, which will start now. And we'll start with John Sessions if we can and go down the line, improvising the rap, the fruit rap. I like horses and whales. I like any type of crime. I like oranges, apples, and hairy lime. I like to make myself go toot, 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 and then I hit myself with a drop of fruit. Ow! Oh. <laughs> I like peaches, I like pears. I like oranges and I don't cares. I eat them plain, I eat them with a peel on, and then I throw up all over the place because <laughs> I don't really like to. <laughs> well, I was walking down the street just the other day. I was looking good, I was feeling okay. I was feeling fine, but I couldn't think of anything to rhyme with. Melon! <laughs> I like fruit, I eat it more than I ought to. Uh, uh, I, I find fruit makes your mouth water. Um, uh, 
But I quite like pears and I quite like apples. Um, and I like those fruits that they sell. Uh, oh, that was apples, wasn't it? I'm sorry, I got that rhyme completely wrong. There we are. Uh, I like bananas. Uh, I like figs. Um, I quite like bacon. Uh, it comes from pigs. Uh, yeah. All right, well, I'll, I'll give some points there for the moment. I'll give... Um, February 15, with a deduction of five from Stephen for mentioning bacon again. I'd like to keep you on the, on the subject there. We now come to what is virtually our last game, in which uh, I play a part in the sense that uh, the conceit of this game is that I'm sitting on a life raft, uh, floating in the Atlantic or the Pacific or somewhere, and uh, acting ad lib, the various contestants can just volunteer the worst characters you could possibly imagine hauling themselves up onto a life raft. Oh, hello, Derry Tableson here. It's bloody wet in that water, isn't it? Listen, I saw your raft coming by and I thought, cold blimey, and an acne boy, he's dead boy like me. I thought I'd come in here and tell you all about some men for fox. She's a gorgeous girl. No, wait, listen, she's absolutely famous. Oh. <laughs> What's wrong with it? You're over the side, Derek. <laughs> hey, have you heard the news? The good news. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful to be on board. My name's Giles, by the way. You can call me Mr. Brandreth. Um, <laughs> listen, why don't we all play party games? <laughs> I remember the last time I saw you and I said I would finish singing that folk song. I met a girl about five years ago. And then you join in with... Hello, hello. Come on, sing. Hello, hello. Quite enough. Next one. Hello, uh, my name is Ponsonby. I'm from the uh, Acme Stone Cladding Company. Have you uh, considered stone cladding at all for this uh, beautiful edifice at all? Is there room on this rough for me, actually? Oh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. The name's Smith, Cyril Smith. Is there any room? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's, that was our final game, and uh, awarding ten points each. So it's just... Uh, as far as scoring is concerned, we just need to announce the final positions in the scoring. And it's very, very exciting because everybody was in the high 90s, but winning this week was John Sessions. Well done, John. And the, the, special, the special prize that we devised this week for the winner uh, is that uh, he would get the job of reading out the credits at the end of the show in the style suggested by the other competitors. Um, and John isn't playing any part in this decision. Edward and Fox. Edward Fox. Yeah, well, Edward Fox. a real off-the-wall sort of suggestion for, for John to do. <laughs> we'll stick with Edward Fox. Get on with it. Well, that's all we've got time for this week, so it's goodbye from all the contestants, and this is me, Clive Anderson, saying goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Whose Line Is It In? I've featured Stephen Fry, John Sessions, Hugh Laurie and Enright Tell. Obviously two well-educated people and two common people. In the chair was Clive Anderson and Colin Selvers at the piano. The show was advised and compiled by Mark Levison with the producer Dan Patterson who doesn't buy shirts in German Street. Good night. We present Whose Line Is It Anyway? And here's your chairman, Clive Anderson. Hello, hello, and welcome to Whose Line Is It Anyway? A program of ready wit and spontaneity whose very title sounds like a piece of improvisation, albeit not a particularly good one. This week we have with us, as usual, John Sessions, the thinking man's Mike Yarwood, and Stephen Fry, the thinking man's John Sessions. <laughs> also, Nonny Williams, the actress and writeress, and last but not first, Jimmy Mulville, star of the cult Channel 4 late-night comedy series, Who Dares Watch? Who Dares Wins? <laughs> now, our first game is called Authors. Uh, each contestant has come along with an author that, uh, in whose style he or she is prepared to improvise a story. And perhaps I'll start by just getting from the various contestants who their authors are. Who have you come along with, Stephen Fry? Sir Geoffrey Ar Archer. Sir Geoffrey Archer. <laughs> yes. Ar Archer. You know... <laughs> Sir Geoffrey Ar Archer. You obviously know something we don't know. Yes, Has he been knighted? 
20. Of course, by the time this goes out, he may have been uh, 90. Well, I, I'm sorry, I'm looking to the future. We live in hopes. And, uh, Jimmy, which author have you uh, uh, chosen? I've the 20th century Jane Austen, Jackie Collins. <laughs> Jackie Collins? Yeah. Nonny? Uh, I think Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer? I think Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer. Right. And John? The theatrical memoirs of John Gilgood. <laughs> Jolly good. Now, the story that uh, we'd like you to improvise is one which the audience is going to tell us. So if we can have a, a suggestion from the audience of a story, maybe a short story title, that would be good for those various authors to tell a story. Thomas the Tank Engine. Thomas the Tank Engine. <laughs> you're, you're out a bit late, I think, aren't you? <laughs> could, could we have more of a sort of... A, Suggestion of a story, not a specific story like that, but uh, d describing, like the, you know, the life of a penny or something like that. The life of a penny. <laughs> a lost sock. A lost sock. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> that is a suggestion rather than a complaint, is it? I don't know. <laughs> so the story title is bizarrely a lost a sock. A lot of room there for narrative, uh, <laughs> and for doing a sequel, I should imagine. But uh, <laughs> so starting off. <laughs> Starting off then, uh, please, Stephen, as Sir Geoffrey Archer. Chapter One. <laughs> Charles Henderson, MP, sate in his char. <laughs> <laughs> Idly scratching his hip. <laughs> Chapter Two. <laughs> Some were a telephone ring. Panatella, for it was she, strode across the crushed velvet floor. She saw his throbbing manhood. <laughs> Your manhood is throbbing, she said. <laughs> yes, I know. I must get it seen to. <laughs> he was six foot two in his stocking feet. She was seven foot three. <laughs> Iwis, Quadche. Where is that socky? of which we have heretofore been asked to tell. <laughs> I know he not he. He have not mentioned to me no socky down at Lawnoretti's shop. But I feel in me a new quality of socky. I think it was dear Maggie Titheridge in maybe 1936. <laughs> 1937, we always came to the theatre, the theatre. Stand there in the Albury Theatre, and I remember dear Edith Evans she would stand there and start acting. She had to have her ankles. She simply had to have her ankles, and her ankles consisted always of a table if she was doing Ibsen, and uh, sometimes of an Anthony Macassar if she was doing Henry Arthur Jones or Arthur Wing Pinero. And of course, in the event that she was doing a modern kitchen sink drama, she had to have a sock. I think we might carry on with that, but do another story. I think we, we exhausted the sock there. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> the life and times of a JCB. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Chapter nine. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was Dick Francis. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph Digger Murchison, <laughs> an Australian excavator <laughs> who knew the hiding place of the stolen jewels that Charles Henderson had been sitching for. <laughs> this was a very big tool. <laughs> when that aprile guineth for to shinny, and people go a down to B and Q, <laughs> and buy themselves for mica working toppies, then think I I must hire the JCBE. <laughs> I never worked with the GCB before. I, I remember, <laughs> I remember one occasion. It was probably 1954-53 after I'd just done Venice Observed, and all of a sudden I, I realised it was the only way to act because of the young people were doing this. Wonderful young actors becoming long, you know, Albert Finney and people like that. Lovely young muscular boys, and um, <laughs> they um, they absolutely spend with anything electrical, some mechanical drills, JCBs, dumper chuck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we managed two stories there, so I think I can give double points to everybody. Uh, 20 points to everybody on that round. The next game is called Genre Option. Genre Option. 
Um, two players working as a team will be given the setting of a scene and they will improvise that scene. At any point, I'll stop them with my buzzer and ask you in the audience to supply a different style for them to act in a theatre style or a film style, um, something like that. Um, so, Stephen and Jimmy, the um, scene which I'd like you to start acting is that of an interrogator and a prisoner. Who is being the interrogator? Uh, you can, well, I, I can sort that out myself. Answer, answer the question, who is going to interrogate? <laughs> You can be the interrogator, Stephen. Thank you. And Jimmy can be the prisoner. And um, just start off in your own style, and then we'll get suggestions of a film or theatrical style from the audience when, when I stop you. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Sit down. Now. <laughs> Where were you last Friday? I was at home. No, you weren't. You're in prison. You've been here for two weeks already. <laughs> Disney. We've got a Disney suggestion, so Karen in Disney characters. <laughs> Ha, 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 little fella. <laughs> Sorry? Play school. Play school. Play school. Sort of a style, I suppose. <laughs> Nothing. Yes. What's the day? <laughs> Today's the day I got nicked. Mm -hmm. Now, where's Teddy? <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> maybe, maybe a film style? Hang on, I've got two different ones there. Western there, and what was your one? Sound of music. John White. Derek Jarman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> Let's go with the Western. That seemed the most uh, ah. easy one to take on board. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> now, boy. Yep. you got to tell me something. Yep. Now, tell me straight away. Yep. Where's my horse? Uh, well, it's... You gonna done take my horse? I gotta know where that horse is. It's in, it's in my trouser pocket. <laughs> well, now I'm gonna ask you to hand it over to me. Okay, here goes. It's a, I, it's a big fella. You're pretty slow on the draw with that horse. <laughs> I, it's just my horse. Oh, good old Scottish, I don't know. <laughs> you didn't say the wild west of Scotland, did you? <laughs> uh, here we are. Ah. It's, it's a little horse from uh, Ibiza. The oh. little. Which, uh, Silent movies. Well, we'll just pause while that particular member of the audience is ejected. Hang on. Oh, get carried away. Centurions, yes. Oh, Miss Gossage, Miss Gossage, Miss Gossage. Girls, 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 girls. No, 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 please, 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 don't. I miss, miss, it wasn't me, miss, honestly. It was Lola. Hello. <laughs> now then, what have you been doing? What have you been up to? Come on. Nothing, miss, honestly. Honestly, I haven't been doing anything. Who am I doing? <laughs> what, uh, Dynasty or Dallas, can you combine those two in a... Well, they have, so don't you... <laughs> You're a loser, Barnes. <laughs> You're a loser. I love her, for God's sake, I love her. Well, you go out and buy yourself something real pretty now, you hear? <laughs> I'm going into the shower. I might be some time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll end on that one. Thank you. I think five points each there to Stephen and Jimmy for a range of styles, never once mentioning interrogation. <laughs> well, now we go on to John and Nonny, and the scene at we'd like you to do is of a policeman trying to talk a suicide down off a roof. So we've got some more suggestions of styles, so we can do a thit. Charades. Restoration. Restoration. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> we start. Faith, madam, coming through Ranella this morning. I could not help noticing. There, upon the roof, you stand, bouncing like a pomander. But you see, good sir, you have a well-tuned leg. Aye, madam, but I walk with a list. It's true you walk with a list, sir. And tis because you walk with that said list that I must therefore hurl myself in these heights. What? Film noir. You do not understand, Alain, how very important it is for my philosophy that I kill myself. Only then can I be happy. <laughs> C'est vrai. C'est vrai. Oui. On va rester là, oui. Comment? <laughs> Pantomime. Pantomime. That's a good one. Children, where is the pistol? 
Yeah. I can't see it. Behind you. I can't see it. Where is it, children? Oh, oh good. Oh, good. Now I can kill myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, yes, I can. Oh. <laughs> oh, another one, another okay, one, another what star. Music hall. Go blimey, I was walking down the road the other day. I was walking down the road the other day. She'd be on the roof. Who's on the roof? There's a lady on the roof. There's a lady on the roof. I said, she's on the roof. I says, madam, I says, madam, is that the acne empire? I says, that I've broken both of them. Yeah, here's another one. She's on the top of the roof. She's standing right, on the so. roof. Well, with husband like that, you'd be on the roof, wouldn't you? I ask you, not me. Thank you very much. Uh, Let's end on that one. Thank you. <laughs> I think those are very good, so I'll give you four points each there, just to be unkind. Now, now the next game is called uh, Wrong Theme Tune. Again, they'll be working in pairs, and they'll be acting out a favourite television or radio programme, but in the style of a different theme tune. That's why it's called Wrong Theme Tune. So, Stephen and Nonny, could you step forward and you're to perform the South Bank show doing some sort of presentation on uh, French Impressionist painting. Got that? But you do, it in, you do it in the style of this theme tune. <laughs> Dan, I told you to get along down to that Tate Gallery. Oh, I don't like them Impressionists very much. I quite like, uh, what's he called, Babby Davrot. But I don't like the other ones. That day garden, he wouldn't like anybody. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> like Noel Coward. But what you've got to understand, Dan, is the Impressionists aren't just day well, They do them pigs and all. Do they do pigs? They do them pigs, they do them chickens. But didn't you know, That's in this Aram documentary, <laughs> what we're making about Toulouse Lautrec, he had swine fever and all. Ah, that old trick, he wasn't no impressionist. He was. No, he wasn't. He did impressions of a very small man on his knees. No. <laughs> he did. No, he wasn't no impressionist. He was a kind of fan de siècle kind of a figure. <laughs> That's what he was. He was a sort of fan de... He wasn't a formalist. He was no formalist. <laughs> no. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and a definite eight points each there as we go on to John and Jimmy... John Sessions, Jimmy Melville, <laughs> doing uh, commentary on the ballet from Sadler's Wells. Yes. Or anywhere, come to that. Yes. 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 To this theme tune. I'm coming over now. She's coming right over the um, top of oh, the Jim Carner now. It's absolutely splendid. Marvelous. I think this is a folk can uh, version. There was 15 hands right. uh, when we last counted. It was indeed. She got yeah. a lovely action, this girl. Uh, oh, and there she goes. Uh, she's, over the, she's over the water jump there. <laughs> she's <laughs> just over the swans. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. <laughs> I think it's lovely the way that the tails go up at the end of that lovely part of her fashion. It's so very much uh, Stravinsky and oh, also we see... Oh, I, I, don't like, I don't like these foreign riders they've got there. They're, I can see in there he's got the... He's, uh, is he a gelding? No, no, he's no. not. <laughs> no, he definitely isn't. Yes, thank you very much. I think I'll give you ten points each there just to stop you. And we now move on to another game, which is called Every Other Line. Now, each person in a pair is given a script of a play to read out, and the other person has to improvise a completely different scene, but obviously going in with every other line of the play. So, does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, starting off, we'll have Nonny reading from a play called Strife by John Goldsworthy, which I'm sure you've all read, and she'll be reading lines from that, where Stephen will be trying to improvise, uh, trying to end a relationship. And just to give you something to aim at, we'd like an end line to the scene that, that Stephen should be aiming at. So we've got a end, nice end line that somebody could suggest. That's all for now, folks. <laughs> That's all for now, folks. It has a certain finality Good. ring to it, doesn't it? Good. So that's all for now, folks. Uh, Nonny reading from Strife and Stephen improvising, ending the relationship. Go. Right. Um, Folksy, darling, I, I don't know how to... <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh... I don't know how to tell you this, so I'm going to have to come right out with it. I hate you and I want to leave you. It's all very well to smile. You want bracing up. <laughs> yes, I do want bracing up, and that's why I've got to leave you. You depress me, folksy. And I you don't... think that'll be the wisest thing? Yes, I do, to be perfectly honest. I, I can't see any way rather, uh, other way around it. I'm having an affair anyway. Thank you, my lady, but I think you ought to marry me. 
You know, one of the reasons I've always hated you, Otis, <laughs> is that you never really seem to notice my body. It's just my mind you're after. You're so shallow. Yes, dear, you can air it here. <laughs> well, if, if things go on like this, I, I might stick with you after all, you know. Anything the matter? You seem awfully down. <laughs> well, <laughs> perhaps you couldn't just read me a, a few passages from French literature. That might perk things up a bit. I... Has Mother been giving you a tonic? Well, I'm sorry, but that's all there is, folks. Yes, I'd say 15 each there for the reading and the improvising. As we rattle on to John Sessions now reading from a play called Black-Eyed Susan by uh -huh. Douglas Gerald. Another play noticeably out of copyright. Mm. And improvising <laughs> to that, to every other line of that, is uh, Jimmy Mulville, obviously. And he'll be improvising a father explaining to his young son the facts of life. Just, what are um, they, Clive? Can you explain to me first? <laughs> Just make them up if you don't know them. Right. I've got to get a last line from somebody. No, Whose child is it anyway? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who? I'm happy yes, whose child is it anyway? I think that's, uh, that's right. a ring to it. Whose uh, child is it anyway? That's what you're aiming at. Don't just go straight in there okay. with the final line. You get... <laughs> yeah. So you're pregnant. Whose child is it anyway? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tommy, come in here for a minute, will you have? Uh, just sh shut the door, come in. He was never known to disobey command. Quite. <laughs> No, no, put away the soldiers. Um, come in, sit down. Now, look, has your, has your mother known what you will? No, what she wouldn't have. Um, do you know, do you know about the fact, do you know how the bit, how we, how your mum and I, do you, has, look, am I making myself clear? Well, I fixed it, anchored it, fore and aft, with chain cable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's a start, certainly, son. <laughs> Yeah, you, you do want to look after it because uh, <laughs> it'll look after you. Now, what you do is you go out for dinner, you see, with the aforementioned... What lady. are you? <laughs> I'm a man. <laughs> now, you, now you know one of your shipmates attend to speak to your character? Have you no one? <laughs> you're, not, you're not doing that married Joanna, are you, son? Why, he plays upon the fiddle like an angel. <laughs> Look, I've seen the girl, and I know she's up the spout, so you must know something about the facts of life. Remove the prisoner. <laughs> I just want to know, whose baby is it anyway? He has the clip. Oh, yeah. Oh, in there. <laughs> Yeah, well, 20 points each there, with a five-point deduction for John for forgetting what the end line was. To a favourite game, favourite amongst everybody apart from the contestants. It's called Improvising a Rap. <laughs> and uh, we all know what a rap is. It's very easy to do, apparently. And uh, all they have to do is to, when the drum beat gets going, is to improvise a rap on a topic which, again, could somebody suggest for them to do. Some nice wide topic. Fish! Fish, Fish is a topic. Starting with John. When you're swimming in the water down by Bermuda, you're gonna bake yourself wash with a barracuda. You're gonna see every type of fish, you're gonna see every type of fin. Then you go in the water, you're gonna get out again. <laughs> if you wanna stay young and you don't wanna wrinkle, you should eat your haddock, you should eat your winkles. If you wanna keep a lot of space, Eat your halibut, eat your place. Thank you. you. Woo. I don't like chops and I don't like ham. I don't like lamb and I don't like spam. I don't like anything, I don't like gammon. And just give me a nice piece of salmon. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> well, I rather like the weathermen. Um, <laughs> They're so fiffly cool. Uh, there's Ian McGaskill, he's no fool. But uh, the one man in Britain I think is really delish, and that's that super sexy person, Michael Fish. Fish, yeah. Fish. Who's, who's idea you go down in the deep to have a look around. You just swim and swim and poke, poke around. You don't know what to do or say, and then you see a very big stingray. <laughs> Not very funny, but it rhymes. <laughs> I 
I saw a man the other day dangling his rod. Um, <laughs> and uh, then he started fishing, um, by God. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I saw what it was that he was landing. It was a piece of cod that passes all understanding. Oh, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Well, very good. I think at least 20 points to all of you. How? With a bonus one point to Stephen for having a rhyme this week. <laughs> uh, we're now going to have another round, which is called Interviews. Uh, again, working in pairs, starting off with Stephen and John. And we'd like John to pretend to be an interviewer mm -hmm. from Rolling Stone magazine. Yeah. And uh, he's going to interview Stephen, but yes. playing the part of a historical character. And again, a suggestion, if we could, from the mayor. Martin Luther. Great. Richard Luther. Oliver Cromwell. Joan of Well, a lot of suggestions came flooding out there. Um, I would have said that possibly Richard the First was quite, quite a good one, or was that... Richard the First? Are you happy with Richard the First? Yes, fine. Oh, yeah, I'll do what I'm told. Yeah. <laughs> All the same to me. Go ahead, then, uh, John. John Sessions, you are the interviewer from Rolling Stone, yeah. and Stephen no, is playing Richard the First. It's a very A&R type of thing, of course, and... The way that DIP and TXKF are very much non communard no thank you very much, not coming back the long and windy road. So very much a case of whether Blondell is Mandel. I see all my work as really basically a kind of crusade. Um, <laughs> the first one, as you know, rather flopped. It didn't work very well. Um, what, essentially what went wrong, as far as I could tell, was that we just didn't have the right group of people around us. I need, um, I need a kind of, because I write all the songs, as you probably know, uh, I don't like to talk about that. Was the pressure work. with Saladin? Yeah, there was pressure with Saladin. <laughs> he eventually split up to form his own band, uh, The Infidels. Uh, was, that, was that Mick Saladin? The, the, no, The, the Infidels, they, they were. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, oh, God, I'm oh, sorry, I've got this bloody lion in my heart. <laughs> so I've been popping lions all day. So. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, you know, things were pretty bad back home when I got there. Do you think with the chain mail that you could be called heavy metal or... <laughs> no. You know, I'm rather like a suitcase, you know. Yeah. Well, I resent labels and I'm quite hard to pick up. Right, you know? yeah. Um, had such a punchline field, I thought we'd better end there. Very good. Uh, 15 points each there to both of you there. And now going on, obviously, to Nonny and Jimmy. Jimmy, this time playing the interviewer from the Sun newspaper. I don't know if you've ever read that. And Nonny playing a fictional, a fictional character from some work of literature. A female. Well, female I was thinking of more, you know. Tess of the D'Urbervilles. That's very good, yes. Thank goodness we've got a literary member of the audience. No idea who Tess of the D'Urbervilles is, but there it is. So, uh, Jimmy Marvel playing the part of the Sun reporter and Nonny being Tess of the Durbervilles. Miss Durbeville, uh... Yes? Tess. <laughs> Tess. Uh, how big are they, love? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know... It, it depends what time of year it is. If we plant them in the spring... That's all right, love. Go on, go on, sorry, sorry. Go on. I was telling oh. you about my mangle wurzels. You see, one is very big. Yeah, well, yeah, well, That's lovely. the one I plant, but... The... How do you start with Dirty Den? Who? Dirty den, dirty den, dirty den. Oh, yeah, dirty right. den. Oh, for the voice. He, 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 That's lovely. He'd be the village idiot. Dirty den. He'd be the one with the long straw coming yeah. out of his now, mouth. Now, who's this bloke? Hardy. Oh, <laughs> who's he? Oh, old Hardy. Is that his nickname? Yes, that that's his nickname? right. Oh, that's right. Well, he was a great friend of mine, you see. And is he a big boy? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well I, I believe he is big in London. Bungalow London. Tom Hardy. And, and then there are parts. In Tess of the Dobermills. I like yes. it, I like it. It's shaking yeah. up, shaking up. Off the voice, off the voice. You, Lovely. Thank you for working. That's right. And uh, 20 points each there, yes. Well, now we go on to something called an audition piece. And we have to imagine that I'm holding an audition for the role of Hamlet. And in their own time, and just as they feel it, the members of the team here will be coming up and being the worst possible people to be playing Hamlet. Go. Well, except, you see, I've just finished at the Italia Conti Stage School. <laughs> and I'm, I'm ten years old, and my mummy and my mummy and my agent both say I'm terribly good and really absolutely suited to the, the part of the... Next. 
Um, hello. I, uh, I got a slight problem. I think I should uh, be honest about it. I can't pronounce my B's. <laughs> um, it's, the, it's the letter after S. You see, I can't say it. B. But anyway, I'll, uh, here goes. <laughs> Booby. <laughs> or Knob Booby. <laughs> Next. Off of my lord. <laughs> to be? Or not to be? That is the question. Next. Hello, come here off the street. I just came off the street. I just, I just come off the street. And I, and I, 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 Um, it did, it did say on the door, only people who are totally unsuitable, uh, to actual audition. Uh, I spent four years with the RSC. <laughs> Satire. <laughs> Congratulations, you've got the part. Well, I think 20 points each there. Oh, and the scores are very, very exciting. Um, oh, John came last, unfortunately, with only 125. But winning this week is Jimmy Mulville. God. Anyway, the prize for winning is that uh, he, gets, he gets to read out the, um, the end credits. And he'll do that in a style that uh, I'll suggest to him. And if you could do it in the style of Murray Walker. Right. <laughs> well, that's the end of the program for this week. So this is me, Clive Anderson, saying goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> oh, who's lining it anyway? Featured Stephen Fry, John Sessions, Jimmy Marvel, and Nonny Williams. In the chair was Clive Anderson. The show was divine and compiled by Mark Leveson with the producer Dan Patterson. Now, Clive Anderson gives Stephen Fry and John Sessions silly things to do. Abetted by Griffiths Jones and Kate Robbins. We present Whose Line Is It Anyway? And here is your chairman, Clive Anderson. Hello and welcome to another edition of Whose Line Is It Anyway? The radio improvisation program. Once again, we bring to the microphone the wittiest, funniest and cleverest talents available in the country today. But enough about me, let's introduce the contestants. <laughs> As usual, we have Stephen Fry, a man of many parts, some of which he'll be using in the course of the programme tonight. And John Sessions, our other regular, whose prodigious performing skills it will be impossible to describe, as well as he does. Joining them are actress and singer and TV personality Kate Robbins, and finally, I'm pleased to welcome a very close personal acquaintance of mine, Griff Reese jones whose comic partnership with Mel Smith has been frequently compared to that of Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, and not always unfavourably. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the contestants. Now, our first game is called Authors. In a moment, the panel are going to be given by the studio audience a subject or a title for a story to tell, and they'll take it in turns to continue telling it. And they'll move on from contestant to contestant on the sound of this noise. And they'll be telling the story in the style of an author that each of them has selected for his or herself. So, first of all, I'll ask the contestants which author they've selected. So, Stephen, who have you gone for? Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Longfellow, jolly good. And Kate? Edna O'Brien. Edna O'Brien. Jolly D. And Griff? <laughs> um, Edward Lear. Um, Edward Lear. Right. Yes. Jolly good. <laughs> Is that related to the, the Edward Lear? Or... <laughs> I'd have thought so. John, uh, who... 
J.R.R. Tolkien. Tolkien, oh, oh, and a popular choice, sir. I, feel... <laughs> I think three people have read him. Now, 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 of course, we need a subject for a story for them to tell. Anybody got a suggestion for the subject for, or a title? Like, you know, like Day in the Life of a Penny or something like that? <laughs> Don't all come at once. So... <laughs> Pantomime. Pantomime, that's not a bad suggestion, but then again, it's not a good one. Can we, <laughs> can we have more like a title, more descriptive thing to give them some... Iran Gate. Sorry? Iran Gate. Iran Gate. Uh, yes, a bit, a bit long, that, I should think. Well, there's something around the world. Christmas and, Carol. A Christmas Carol. Yeah. Well, yes, that's, that's very suitable for March when this is being brought. <laughs> Why not? Yes, but why not? Let's do a Christmas carol. Oh, sorry, the tension is killing me here. Can we make it all night? Uh, no, we're doing a Christmas carol. So, oh, Christmas uh, carol. starting off with uh, Stephen in the style of your author, if I remember, was Longfellow. Yeah. There's a time in late December, in late December, there's a time. There's a time you sing your carols, sing your carols in December. Sing them, sing them, sing them, son of Hiawatha, mini ha ha. <laughs> sing your. Sing your carols, sing them loud, sing them now, sing them proud. Sing your carols, sing your carols, sing them, sing them. Sing them inside, sing them outside, sing them upside down and sing them right side. Sing them now, sing them then, sing them, sing them, sing them again. <laughs> carols? That's what they sing at Christmas, isn't it, Bernadette? said Colleen as she kissed the inside of the priest's nostril. <laughs> I love singing carols, only I wish Jesus would go out with me. <laughs> she pulled on her printed smock and said, Don't be so silly, Bernadette. You know Jesus loves you anyway, but not in a sexual way. <laughs> there was a young woman of air. who had a bit of holly in her hair. She sat on a leaf. <laughs> on that bit down beneath. That silly young woman from air. Aragorn looked at the window. It was frosted. Frosted as the riders rode across the road. Why were they bringing a lantern with them? It's easy, said Strider, son of Lyder, son of Mida, Guider, Rider. <laughs> they are the elves, come to sing to us. Will it be, will it be once in all David City, shouted Pippin, his face crackling in the firelight. Oh no. <laughs> it is the elven carol. Karath, Muath, Kera, Kera. Bora, Kora, Pera, Pora. Kurath Murath, son of Burath, easy water riding lightly. <laughs> it's the boat. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, you're nothing like Dublin. <laughs> In the land of the Bingle Pongle, where the Jingle Jongle goes, there was a Bingle Bongle with a great big red old nose. Where the Bingle Pongle Pangles and the Bingle Dangle does, it sang a Christmas carol. <laughs> They finished their singing and the light grew across the hill. The light grew brighter and brighter. Great flames like swords dashed out towards Mordor. There they came, running towards them. The Nazgul, those awful nasal people who sound like folk singers, singing one carol after another. One after another they sang and flew higher into the heights of Mordor. Down they flew, depth to depth, like the long nostrils of Brian Johnson. Down and deep they went into the depths. And then we realized we had no change for the carol singers. Ah. Thank you I've uh, got to order some points there, and I think it'd be invidious to really distinguish between uh, any of the performances there. I always find that. Well, that reduces my role as a scorer, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> let's give you ten points each for that, just to, to start us off. Okay. <laughs> now, the next game I can't pronounce is called Genre Option, and I give uh, two players the setting of a scene, and they have to improvise that little scene. But at any point, I stop them with a buzz, <laughs> and they have to continue the scene, 
uh, but in the uh, style, a different theatre style or a film style, a different genre. Okay, so we start off with Stephen and Griff, and um, I want you to act, if you would, an alien landing and being met by an earthling, an earthman. So perhaps Griff, you could be the alien, as you're more <laughs> obviously alien uh, to most, uh, most things. And Stephen, can you be the earthling? Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of part you could probably uh, bring yourself to do and the different styles I'd like the studio audience to suggest when we buzz and wait for a new style uh, so starting off acting your scene first of all with no particular style well some style obviously that you rent it and uh, and then we'll buzz and interrupt you so Stephen and Griff <laughs> well it sounds like there's a cappuccino machine somewhere <laughs> um, can we have a style to go into? 50s documentary. 50s documentary, okay, go ahead. Greetings, Earthling. I've come from the other side of the universe <laughs> to see what's going on here on this little planet Earth. My, here's a jolly little fellow. <laughs> and don't the kids love him? Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It just shows Britain can make it after all. <laughs> Another style? The clangers. The clangers. The clangers. Far away. <laughs> Is, it, is, is that an English word? Or is that... <laughs> Do you know what that means? Yes. No. <laughs> so we'll have to have something that we... Uh... Western. Okay, let's go with the Western then. That was the, West. that was the other suggestion. Yeah. Well, oh, sorry. who the hell we got here? <laughs> I I knew why I was on the Here, stranger, I just come and landed my little space machine down here in your corral. Just exactly what are you doing in this town, mister? I come here because... Because? I want to talk slow. <laughs> Another genre? Theater? Sorry? Melodrama. Mm, yeah. Melodrama. Or a Griffin melodrama. You fiend, you unutterable fiend, you hound of hell, you dog, you animal. You should die like a cur. You Sir Jasper, how could you talk to me like that? <laughs> you have traduced the good name of my family, of my little Emily. You're a whore, a scarlet-painted, stumpy trollop woman. But, but I you... love you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, that's not allowed. Yep. I think that's very good. And uh, 15 points each there for that. I think that's a very good contribution. So we'll now move on to John and Kate. And could we have you playing a plumber and a housewife? And so, as, as before, if you start off, act, and then we'll switch the styles as we get to them. Did you want to use the washing machine later on today? Or today? <laughs> it's the second time this week I've had my pipe seen to. <laughs> you one for innuendo, right? <laughs> anyway, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll... A style? Musical. Okay, musical. Oh, I love you. Do you love my sink? Oh, I really hope that you think that I'm lovely. Just lovely. lovely. Come and see to my water. To your water. I'll tell you what I'll do. It's stainless steel. Yeah. It's easy as a breeze. Is it really? <laughs> I tell you what you do. You turn me on so. Let's go upstairs for a Sneeze. Oh, yeah, freeze, me. I'll tell you what I'll do. What I'll bring my spat, I'll bring my brother Jake along. We'll sing. <laughs> yes, we'll sing. I want to see Jake. I know he won't be nice as you. You're oh, so come lovely. Come off it, come off it. We'll do some sun time. Some sun time. <laughs> Another style to follow that? Shakespeare? A plum is but in the sky. It may jib as high as a corn crake, but not as low as thee, my lady. <laughs> I can't answer that. Face two again. Another one? Horror. Horror. Okay, horror. Oh, and there's some really some awful some things that are clinging inside the drain that are stuck to the tubes that are stuck to the pipes and... <gasps> oh, God. You precisely what I tell you. Go back to your room tonight, get the spanner, get the bag. Yes? Put it it's... beside the bed. Yes. Not on any circumstances. Go beyond the window tonight. If you oh. do, you will not be raped by a plumber, but instead, even worse, by a window cleaner. Do you understand? Oh. <laughs> understand? Children's television. 
That seems to get a popular vote, yes. <laughs> Let's go through the round window and look at what's happening with the plumbing there. That's a large sink, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bit like Scylla and Charybdis, isn't it, for people who go to private school? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we went down some bizarre roads there, but I think uh, I think ten points each there. Ten points each there, Squirrel. Now, now we're going to go on to improvising a rap. We give them a basic, nice, very, very popular game, except except with anybody who has to do it. Um, now, can we give a nice topic for James Anderton? <laughs> not not bad, a bit limiting, really. I mean, obviously not James Anderton himself, but. Uh, more general than that. General Anderton. General Gordon. So, <laughs> anyway, another suggestion? Drops. Sorry? After the bomb drops. After the bomb drops. Uh, a bit too cheery. Any, any other <laughs> suggestion? The NHS. The NHS. No, there's not much of that left, is there? So... <laughs> oh, satire. Will somebody shout out what he's asking to hear? <laughs> Whoever it is. We're just waiting for one. We got the rehearsed. subject holidays okay. early on. Who's got that? I think. <laughs> Unfortunately, we okay, have had... Clive, we've had about five or six. We could all get going on those. You're just trying to make it difficult for us, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Now, any, any, other, any other suggestions? Nice general topic. Tabloid newspapers. Tabloid newspapers? No more general than that. <laughs> you, you want to do tabloid newspapers? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the newspaper rap. Come on, do the newspaper rap, starting with the drum beats, as of now. Starting with John and working down that way. England's under the democracy, it's into being free and no comment, no FT and I'm saying the best kind of thing you read is the sun and if you don't like tits, at least you can have fun. Yes, yes, yes. I was reading my paper the other day and what do I see in the headline it say? That James Anderton is the king of the crop. <laughs> He's a man who never know when to stop. He thinks he's God, he thinks he's the Lord, but I don't care because he's... <laughs> making me bored. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I opened up my page the other day. I saw Sammy Fox, she had nothing to say. And she was standing there, she had some bits. And then I looked at a great big long hair, she's blonde. She's so horrible, I don't like her. Nothing rhymes with horrible. Press that first, sir. Whatever you do, if you don't press it now, I'm going to hit, hit you. Well, I was going on holiday with my baby Daxent. Um, no, I'm sorry, I just can't do the accent. Um, <laughs> I was uh, going on holiday, I was rather annoyed because, uh, well, I, I started to think about the great British tabloid and I realised on holiday I was like the editor of a certain one because there I was, lying in the sun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I, I think you must uh, deserve at least 20 points each, so I'll give you five each. Uh, so something, I don't know why it's called party pieces, but in this round, uh, the pairs play different games. First of all, we're going to get Griff and Stephen to play together. Uh, How good! And Stephen is going to be conducting an interview oh, yes. in, in the manner of uh, somebody from the Times Literary Supplement. <laughs> and Griff, the character being interviewed, will be in the character of some historical character, which somebody in the audience might suggest. Henry VIII. Henry VIII. That seems fair enough. Griff will be playing Henry VIII, and Stephen will be interviewing him as though he was from the Times Literary Supplement. Go. Um, Mr. Eight, um, this, you're now on to your... Um, uh, is this your, in fact, your fifth? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I missed two of them. Uh, I, I was aware I was reviewing other, other wives, but I believe um, it's another fifth wife you've brought out. Um, have, any thoughts on it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's right, yeah. I've had five wives now. Well, I say, I didn't have the second one, actually, she wouldn't let me. But, 
Oh, I've had, I've had, yeah, that's right. I've had four and a half wives now. Which, which one? Which, which are the wives? Because um, some of them, it seems to me, uh, have have been rather short-lived. Um, yes. They've, they've, um, that's right. Yes. They've appeared in front of the public. There's some of them been very popular indeed. That's but you've right. Yes. Instantly turned your back on them. Uh, yes. Is your favourite wife always the one you've just finished? Um, uh, oh, by no means. No, no. There was three before. What's her name? Catherine. Yes. Yes. Uh, Three under par, that was, yes. Piece, didn't she? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I kept, that's yes, right, like, somehow, it all seemed too long to me, you see. Yes. I felt they needed editing. That's right. Yes. <laughs> you made some so, cuts. <laughs> that's right. I felt really they were sort of, you know, getting a little bit, you know, over length somehow. Yes. So I sort of took the axe to them, you know what I mean? Yes. Well, not me personally, obviously, yes. you know, I, I had a bloke to do it. I believe the version is now yes. visible on Tower Gate. That's um, right, yes. 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 yes, that's Anne Boleyn. That's that, right. That's the one Doing up there. Very, very popular attraction. Oh, yeah. Uh, Henry, yes. thank you very much. Indeed. Well, thank, thank you. you. That's lovely. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Well, I think a definite ten points for Stephen there, and uh, <laughs> twenty-five for Griff for playing Henry VIII as a costermonger. But <laughs> no obvious reason. I've only got two voices, Clive. Yes. <laughs> well, well, do rush on to the other one, Griff. Now, uh... I'm saving that up for the finale. <laughs> if you're still here. Now we're going to. We're now going to obviously swap round to John and Kate. A completely different sort of role for them, and they're going to be enacting a scene for us. A simple scene with uh, John proposing to Kate. So if you start off in that style, and then I'll buzz as we've done in previous games, and get the audience to suggest some famous couples who could be enacting this scene. Something like, you know, like Romeo and Juliet, something like that, or real people, or just two people that go together. But just start off if you were just playing the part of uh, somebody proposing to his girl. Oh. Paulette, um... Yeah? Now to... You are, do you know that? No, no, I'm not. You're just a loony. No. I'm a bit, I'm a bit, a bit bizarre. I know, but I just love you. You're so fantastic. You're just a loony. Okay, famous couple. John McEnroe and Tatum O'Neill. John McEnroe and Tatum O'Neill, yeah. Do I what? I said, what do you want to say to me? You know, you keep looking so angry. You goddamn angry. know what I want to say to you. It's predictable. Everything you wash Another my couple. white clothes. Den and Angie. Oh. Go on, say it. <laughs> oh, go on, I know I'm done here it, don't you? I know it didn't work out the first time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go on, Dean. But oh, I just wonder whether... Oh, yeah. <laughs> if we married again... Oh, yeah. You could... Another couple. Ro Ronnie and Nancy. Would that be the Reagans? Yes. <laughs> Ronnie and Nancy. You know, well, um... <laughs> That day I, I took you up the aisle and, you know, well, you know, it looked like yes, I was going to marry you. Well, yes, it looks like I got it wrong and I married the font instead. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have to do it again, old Ronnie, cupcake. How can I be sure? <laughs> Maggie, Maggie, Maggie and Dennis. But go on, for God's sake, Dennis, go on, say it, for heaven's sake. Uh, I don't I, have to tell you what to do all the time, do uh, I? Um, I, I'm just wondering whether well, we've been... Yes? We've been, uh, sort of fencing together oh, and... God mud sake, wrestling get on and, with it, man. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I was just wondering whether you wanted to go the whole way, you know, and sort of live in the same house and sort of share an account. As long as you... <laughs> <laughs> Another couple. Victoria and Albert. Isn't that a museum? <laughs> okay, a last one to finish with. Stones. Kermit and Miss Piggy, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Kermit! <laughs> oh, well, uh, I was wondering whether, uh, whether I had a personality change and I suddenly talked like a terrible American film character actor. <laughs> All I can say is, I will! <laughs> well, I hope yeah. you're good with frog spawn. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you ten points each. We have each, another so round here, which is, <laughs> which is uh, sort of a newish game. It's, we call it a great debate. And it's going to be on nuclear disarmament. All the four contestants will be debating nuclear disarmament. But they're going to do it in the role of a type of person which you're going to suggest. 
Well, we have lots of different suggestions because we have one each. So we can have a few suggestions, something like, um, I don't know, megalomaniac seems like quite a good one. But any, I might give that to one of them. Sorry? Footballers. Footballers, okay, footballers. Estate agent. Estate agent. Why is it everyone always yells out estate agents? <laughs> Whatever thing we ask for. Bedwetters. Bedwetters, yeah. <laughs> is that, um... Is that much different from estate agents? Are we all bedwetters agents? or just one of us? <laughs> sort of borders uh, estate agents. We're rather floodier. Yeah? Any other? We're footballers. I. Sorry? I... Town criers. Town criers? <laughs> Town criers from the complete madman over there. <laughs> and what was that one there? Was... Game show presenters. Is it depressing? No, no, we've got enough there. So why, why don't we sort those out? Uh, for, John, you could do footballers, couldn't you? That'd be quite a good one. Yes, game show hosts for you, Kate. Um, I think megalomaniacs seem to fit Griff rather well. <laughs> hang on, hang on. You've suggested megalomaniac. <laughs> oh, well, I, I'm, yes, allowed, to, I'm allowed to it. contribute. Who suggested it? He suggested it. All right, then, Griff, you... you... fed the audience that All right, you wanna... all right. Well, if you're being so cooperative, Griff, uh, why don't you be a town crier, then? Oh. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> so that just leaves me with, um... I heard manic depressive, or am I making that up? Uh, yes, so Stephen, can you be a manic depressive? Yes. Yes? <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm just going to dot around amongst it as you debate uh, nuclear disarmament. Can you start off, John, nuclear disarmament as a footballer? Well, it started very well, really, looking back, you know, um, it's, it's really a question of whether they can keep them in the, in the hole, you know, and if they stay in the hole, they huddle together, you know, at the end of... Kate. Welcome to Blind Fate. <laughs> now, you know what, if you get rid of all those missiles, oh, you're going to have a lot, a lot of war on you. Do you know what? Stephen. Well, you know, you get rid of some of them. Bastards and the other ones, they just replace it with other ones. But then, I don't know, on the other hand, you know, it's not a bad idea. Great. <laughs> Blind. <laughs> Blind. Blind. What are you going to do if you get rid of all them weapons? Because those women are green and calm, you know. They're not going to have anywhere to sleep at night all the... Oh, no. John? You see, you can start off with a three-pack and a two-pack and another three-pack, but at the end of the day, are you going to follow it through, you know? Stephen. Oh, I don't know. It just pisses me off. <laughs> Kate. Oh, yeah, but you see, it's all very well, you Riff. know, but... Now, Gorman Shaw, back in the White House! <laughs> Gorman Shaw, back in the White House! John? Well, since I, since I moved to Marbella, since I moved to Marbella, I see it's a good place, you know, for, for a retired builder, a good place for football and all that. But at the end, Griff... Bomb drops on footballer! <laughs> <laughs> Well, that'll do it. No I'll... harm done. Hang on a minute. <laughs> I had, excuse me, I had a joke about a pair of strikers to go with. Football is pair of strikers. No, no. Well, lucky we didn't have time for it. So, <clears throat> oh, I think we we'll end there. That was, that was a very good end point to come to. And I think uh, 10 points each there and a bonus of 20 for Griff. For being so objectionable. Uh, get on to, no. I think it's the last round now, unbelievably. And uh, this game's called Bad Applicants for some reason. Now, the idea of this game is that I'm pretending to be the first British person in space. I'm in Britain's first space rocket. And uh, as they feel like it, the members of the team here will pretend to be the worst possible applicants for the job to be the other first British spaceman in space. So they can just do it as, as they feel like it and just audition. I'll buzz them out when I've had enough of them. Uh, you don't mind. <coughs> <laughs> you haven't got a spare pack of seniors on here, have you? <laughs> yeah, uh, now, I read about your advert in the Exchange of Mart, and me and my husband would like to come, but I'm worried about him because he doesn't travel well, see? <laughs> and we... Well, I'm a literary singer, dancer, model, right? And I thought that I don't have to eat much, you see, to get my figure. And I thought if I went up in space, I wouldn't have to eat much. I can't really sing, do you know what I mean? But you see, when the Friends Bay Empire opened, when the Friends Bay Empire opened, it was Tommy Trinder, it was Wilson <laughs> Kelp from the battle, <laughs> And it was Max Miller, you see, and we were all on the bill. That's all there was on the bill. 
I'm very excited about the prospect of some of the uh, property out there in space, which hasn't been developed oh. at all. <laughs> It uh, looks to me as if uh, we get there first, we can do some very exciting claim staking, uh, you know. A day in space, a day. I'm a farm worker. I think it'd be really great to go up in space. It'd be really nice. There'd be no pigs. <laughs> no smoke. You see that bolt there? That bolt there, you see? If, if, if I was putting that bolt in, I wouldn't put it in like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the question is whether Saturn is going to stay in the orbit. We don't know if it's going to stay in the orbit. It's possibly going to be there for another 50... The only thing is, I've, um, I've, 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 I've wanted to bring along some Giles Brandreth party games. So we can... <laughs> <laughs> I award another, uh, another 100 points to each of you for that, which produces the result of a very close finish between Stephen, Kate and John, but the winner this week is Griff Rees jones oh. <laughs> And anybody who's been to the show before knows that the prize for winning this particular programme is to get to read out the end credits... <laughs> in, in the style of my choosing, and um, I think I'd like to get Griff to read the end credits in the style of Donald Sinden. Uh, see, if he, <laughs> see if he can manage that. And um, so that's the end of the show. So this is me, Clive Anderson, saying good night. Good night. <laughs> Is it anyway? Featuring Stephen Fry, John Sessions, Griffith Jones, and Kate Robbins. In the Charles Clive Anderson, the show was devised and compiled by Mark Leverson with the producer Dan Patterson. <laughs> Present Whose Line Is It Anyway? And here is your chairman, Clive Anderson. All right, hello and welcome to Whose Line Is It Anyway? If you've heard the programme before, no doubt you'll be reaching for the off switch now, but you'll know that this is a programme of genuine improvisation and wit. <laughs> the contestants themselves are, as usual, led by the game's residence maestro, Stephen Fry, together with our regular mini-metro, John Sessions. <laughs> Joining them this week, well now, it's, it isn't often we have a guest on the programme who is so good and popular with everyone that we want to have them back again. Indeed, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but nonetheless, making a return visit to whose line is Jimmy Mulville from Channel 4's Who Dares? And I think he's in a couple of other TV programmes which are about to hit the fan, hit the screen at any moment. <laughs> Our fourth man is not Anthony Blunt, who for some reason is not available this evening, but a similarly satirical figure, the actor and distinguished purveyor of highbrow comedy, John Bird. Right. Now, the first game we play is called Authors. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously a game Jimmy enjoyed last time. Uh, in a moment, I will ask the studio audience to suggest the title for a story for Stephen Fry to start telling. And he'll do it in the style of an author of his own choosing. But when I sound the buzzer... <coughs> it'll sound a bit like that. Oh, in fact, Sound exactly like that. Jimmy Marvel will continue the story in his chosen author's style and so on around the panel until the story is told or the studio audience have fallen asleep. So, Stephen, which author's style have you chosen to adopt? Clive, I've chosen Homer. Homer. Ah. <laughs> uh, and you do that in, uh, in English or the original Greek? Oh, I think Greek, yes. <laughs> I think so. Good, well, I'll look forward to that, I must say. Jimmy. I'll be doing mine in the style of Dylan Thomas, the well-known um, Welsh artist. Oh, the well-known Welsh yes. artist. Uh, not the obscure Dylan Thomas. Yes. Jolly good. <laughs> Always best to go for well-known authors on yes, this I, one. Yes, I think that's... Now, John Bird. Well, I'm, I'm going to try and do the voice as well. Jane Austen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think the voice is fantastic. And John Sessions. Um, Herman Melville. 
Herman Melville, author yeah. of uh, Moby Herman. Dick. Herman. Herman. Well, those are the authors. Now, of course... What we... did he write, John? Um... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> It begins oh, with M, yes, and yes. ends in Obi oh. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, interesting because my uh, my grandfather actually caught Moby Dick, because they've got a cure for it now. <laughs> now, what, what, that's all right. What, we can we can always cut that one out. <laughs> can we have a suggestion suggestion for a story yeah, or, or for something else to do? Uh, a visit to the dentist. A visit to the dentist. You're holding your mouth. Is it? <laughs> have you just been to a dentist? No, I'm shy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, that, that's you're shy of evident. dentists. Oh. <laughs> yes, one of the shyest people I've ever heard yelling out things at a recording. <laughs> that's all you need is attack of the shy hecklers, right? Uh, and where the pushy people start? <laughs> so, a visit to the dentist in the style of Homer. Um, Stephen Fry, starting in, in the style of Homer. I think I know me nef Harris Stall, but I can law a thech, a thech, a thech up a mola. It's a thacha magazine of punch, a thech, a thele lach, a ha, a po, theus. Daibach. To begin at the beginning, it was a slow black, slow back, Bible black, quick, quick, slow back. Evening. Uh, make mine a large one. Fly any now, I go Pakistani. You better up. <laughs> it is a truth universally acknowledged that no man who wishes to take his place in genteel society or excite admiration for his parts <laughs> should venture onto a radio for a panel game. Particularly one as pratty as this. Ah, <laughs> I have passed thou been in the time or sea, I split thyself. Thou wilt find thy teeth and molars breaking open and incisors too, with quick quick, touch tego and a goo, driving their drills right into the back of your teeth. Aye, ye were there with the Parmacetti and Jehoshaphat. <laughs> Firm-thighed Diomed, <laughs> son of the Doric tree god, went to golden-toothed Achilles' fleet of foot. <laughs> and past the cobblestones and down past the bakery, where there were pink loaves, green loaves, blue loaves, it was dye the bread. <laughs> Into this patient's mouth, Mrs. Bertram. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. <laughs> he hasn't done his joke yet. <laughs> does, it not, does it not bring to mind a resemblance to your fanny? <laughs> I was quite right to have buzzed before. I think I... <laughs> we will sail the Pequod to the Java Sea. And then into the back doors of the private dentist in Wigmore Street. Well, ten points each to everybody, with a five-point penalty to Stephen, though, for using a foreign language. <laughs> and so we go to the next game, which is called Genre Option. I'll be giving two players the setting of a scene, and they'll begin to improvise it. At any point, I'll stop them with the same sound and ask you in the audience here in the studio to supply a, a film style or a theatre style for them to uh, carry on acting that scene, but in that new style. Now, the first pair will be Stephen and Jimmy, and could the little scene you're acting out be landing a plane in a crisis? If Jimmy, you could be the pilot, and Stephen, you're the ground crew, trying to talk him down. So you can start off just in any style, and then members of the audience will be thinking of uh, other styles for the, you to go into, like a Western or a musical or Shakespeare, something like that, some sort of theatre style like that. And on you go. Mayday, no. mayday, mayday. Uh, experiencing difficulties coming into land, please advise. Yes, uh, have you flown one of these before? Uh, <laughs> funny you should mention that, no. <laughs> <laughs> and a style. Yes. Pantomime, I heard pantomime from the front there. Whoops! <laughs> <laughs> I uh, 
think I'm going to crash, boys and girls. I think I am. <laughs> oh, yes, I am. <laughs> Look behind you. <laughs> there should be a knob. Oh. Another start. What was that? Shut Wildlife. up. Wildlife. <laughs> well, they sort of do it like stoots or something. I'm oh, not, no, hang on. That's I'm an expression, isn't it? Hang on, there's hat somebody hold, holding his hat up. He's taking a collection, I think. <laughs> what? Thunderbirds. Thunderbirds. Yeah, yeah I think that bastard. might do. <laughs> Thunderbirds. Scott, stay in control, Scott, at once. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just got one of my strings caught there. <laughs> OK, Virgil, fire away. Well, belady. <laughs> oh, Parker. The most important thing, belady. Yes. Yeah. Gangster. What? Gangster. Ga Some of Fraser's grave, okay. it isn't really a theatre style. But, but, but <laughs> gangster? Oh, I don't know. Gangster. Yes, okay. we have gangster from. Okay, but I've got the plate here. I've got to put it somewhere. Where do you want to put it? Huh? Wait. What's the needle saying, eh? The needle says 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet? And dropping. It's dropping. It's dropping? It's dropping. Where am I going to get rid of 2,000 feet wholesale this time of day? And what? Um, one to finish on? Oh, it's soap opera. Australian soap opera. <laughs> Australian soap opera. <laughs> Not for Christ's sake, Bevelinda. <laughs> What's that, Dork? Get a grip on yourself. I'm sorry, I've never flown one of these things before. Oh, Cripes, it's really good fun, isn't it? Have you heard about Joyce? <laughs> no one has. <heard. laughs> and, and just one more to end on again. Hitchcock. Hitchcock, Hitchcock. That's a good one, Hitchcock. Hitchcock? Hitchcock. <laughs> We don't get too many people okay. here since they built the freeway. <laughs> oh, I thought I'd just book in for the night. Um, can I just park the plane in the, uh, in the patio? I could ask my mum first. All right. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe if I park the plane down here, I'll just yeah, stay there are too many birds in the middle. The birds are bringing the plane down. I there find... are thousands of birds! Thank you very much. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, definitely 20 points each. So we now go on to John Bird and John Sessions acting together. This time, John Bird, could you play the part of a customs officer and John Sessions as a passenger, a traveller, with a rather suspicious sort of package? And being interviewed by the customs officer, you can start off in any style, and again, we'll cut in with perhaps more film styles. We could, uh, we've done a few films, perhaps theatre styles uh, this time, more theatrical-based. Excuse me, do you wear these, sir? Well, not really, no, it's... Um... It's, it's a type of kinetic sculpture. <laughs> and, but it could be an example of typery. <laughs> mm. But what is it? Hang on. Restoration. Restoration. Restoration comedy, I suppose. Take that to be. Restoration comedy. But tell me, sparkling eyes, <laughs> what are these frilly things at the bottom? <laughs> <laughs> Faith, my lord, Faith, all that does walk in Vauxhall and run a lot to a pretty pickle of pinkness. Here we stand in Heathrow Airport, there over there is Stan said, I la, madam, I know thee for thyself. Come to it again. <laughs> no, another star? Pinter. Pin, uh, Pinter. Yeah. Pinter. I'd, I'd fasten Pinter. Well, I think I'd prefer the Pinter. No yeah. insult to the person I didn't take fast from. Right. Uh, who's now being ejected from the room. Do you come... Uh, <laughs> Pinter. Do you come from around here originally? I don't come. I don't know about coming. <laughs> Last night, I walked off the plane with a bag. It's a black bag. Do you like bags? <laughs> I can take bags, or I can leave them alone. You should leave it. Have you got your papers? He's coming later. I told you, he's coming later on. You're always saying that. I'm saying nothing. <laughs> well, I'll relent. Let's go on to farce next, since we had that suggested before. Farce. Quick, quick, into the, into the green channel. But I can't possibly, darling. <laughs> I can't possibly get in the green channel. What are these bags? Oh, no, it's Melinda! Into the red channel. Here comes a man with a cliff palette and the big hat. <laughs> oh, no, it's a dick, and I expected him last week. Come on, darling, quickly. Uh, one, more, one more to end on. Opera. Opera. 
Yes, Would opera. Would you care to open your bag? I would open my bags if I could, but I don't want I would to. like you to open... Marcello! Marcello and Dita! <laughs> quando, quando, bagaggio, rosso, vito, e blanco. <laughs> yes, anyway. Thank you very much. Oh, dear. Oh, that was very, very good. Very good. It should, should really be on television because uh, we get more money. But, uh, the, no, look. <laughs> no, look very good. Um, 25 points each. The scorer's just leaving. Where's the scorer leaving? Oh, he's taking the books round for the next round, which is called Every Other Line. Now, they'll be working in pairs again. And it's going to be John Sessions and Jimmy Mulville. And Jimmy is going to be improvising a scene. And the scene I'd like you to improvise, Jimmy, as the first notice Jimmy's going to get of this, is uh, me, because I can't read my writing. It's uh, you're a patient. A patient what? A patient person, Jimmy. <laughs> Somebody who is ill, a sick person. Right. It's drawn from life in your case. Yes. And <laughs> you're, I am actually. You're, go you're going to the doctor. You think John Sessions is your doctor, yes. and he's improvising the scene with you, but the lines he's doing will be taken from a play called The Watched Pot by Saki, or oh, H.H. Like H. Munro, one of my favourite authors, wrote a few obscure plays, which are fortunately out of copyright. And, uh, <laughs> and the game is for you to try and improvise that, inc incorporating the lines you get from the play that John's reading out to you. And the audience involvement of this is to provide an end line for, the, for Jimmy, essentially, to be aiming at. An end line... You're Give this lady a bedpan. She wants a bedpan. <laughs> yeah. Was that a request or, or, a, or a suggestion? That's the shy lady with the sore tooth wants a bedpan. <laughs> uh, can oh. I have the bedpan now, please? That's, that's a rather easy line to Pretty aim at as, stuff, as a medical it? one. Can I have the bedpan now? Right. We can't go straight to it, Jimmy. You've got to... <laughs> <laughs> get one point for getting the end line, but no other points. OK, so improvising your scene. Everyone remember what the scene was? And the watch pot. <clears throat> Hello, Doctor. Um, I've got this pain um, down my right side. And is that where my superior fascination begins and leaves off? <laughs> well, I would hope you build up to a sort of interest in my right no. side and then maybe get fascinated a bit later on. Mm. Also, I get depressed. Now, don't try and talk pretty. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased that you think I talk pretty. However, I'd like to get back to my depression and I think this, the pain is psychosomatic. Trevor, I'm much more dangerous than any of the others if you only knew it. <laughs> How did you know my name was Trevor? <laughs> because I really want you for myself. <laughs> um, can I have the bedpan now, please? <laughs> oh, I think that's got to be worth 12 points each, I think. So the next pairing is John Bird and Stephen Fry. Stephen, can you improvise the part of a prosecution counsel? Yes. And uh, you're obviously assuming that John is the defendant, but he'll be reading lines from another very well-known play called A Pair of Spectacles by <laughs> Sidney Grundy. <laughs> <laughs> this is a work which is constantly being performed. I need not read it. I mean, I know the lines <laughs> off by heart. <laughs> I think you were in the last production of it, That's weren't you? <laughs> the first production of it. <laughs> <laughs> it came off after one night. But then who doesn't? Now, can we... <laughs> Saucy. Oh. So go ahead, uh, Stephen. Do improvising I have a line to work towards? Oh, of course. You've, con you've, you've mugged up on the rules, haven't you? OK, so an end line, which is not perhaps from the shyest lady in the room who's... Uh, sorry? The butler did it. The butler did it. Oh, very good. Yes, I think that's... The butler did it. We've got Agatha Christie's grandson in tonight. So... <laughs> family memory. So, go ahead. The butler did it as your end line. Double points if you can get to it without forgetting it. Right. Are you seriously asking the court to believe that you were in the middle of the high street in a pair of swimming trunks brandishing a revolver because you were hot and you wanted somehow to raise the alarm? <laughs> Have you brought my boots? <laughs> You recognise these boots, then? These are the boots which were thrown at the poor woman who has just spoken. You've made them very quickly. <laughs> these are the original boots. Are you suggesting they are not your boots? Well, 
my brother Gregory would say this is old stock. Well, it's hearsay evidence, we can't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> One of these two gentlemen is a liar, perhaps both. Which one, the butler or the footman is a liar? <laughs> <laughs> I've no... Ch <laughs> I've no chance today. I've given up waiters. Ah! <laughs> so it was neither the footman nor the waiter. <laughs> father, I want to speak to you. <laughs> I'm not your father. The judge is your father. That's what's depressing me. <laughs> What on earth are you talking about, Father? <laughs> the judge has every right to speak. I don't think you should interrupt him, whether or not he's your father. So, did you do this appalling, appalling crime? Your mother. <laughs> Why don't you call her so? Well, she's, she's a butler. I can't just call her mother. <laughs> so you're saying the butler did it? Well, that became quite existential at points. I think 25 points for each of you there. And why not? Well, now, Stephen Fry and John yes. Sessions, we've got a different game for you to play. Again, this is a new game, though it does sound a little bit like one of the old games from a previous week. What we want to do, starting off with Stephen Fry, we want you to uh, do an ad for us, an advertisement. Oh. I'm sure you wouldn't normally sully your performing no. skills with... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a whore. <laughs> I'm a very good whore. <laughs> so I've heard. But uh, you're doing an ad. Uh, we want you to advertise a breakfast cereal, but in the style suggested by some music that we're going to play in. OK, so breakfast cereal in the style of this music. <laughs> now, there is a breakfast cereal that goes clear to the pain even under the rim. <laughs> Taken from a blend of hand-grown Californian denim, sun-ripened, half the taste, all the fat. <laughs> New Bonto Max. Your kitchen will never be the same again. You know, I think you could sell a lot of breakfast cereal that way. <laughs> Fifteen points there to Stephen. Now we go on to John Sessions. Again, an advertisement for you to do. And it's an advertisement, please, for crash helmets. Mm -hmm. But in the style of this music, now. She's bright, she's young. It's 1955 and she's wearing the brand new crash helmet. <laughs> Here she is now, arriving at the Dominion Theatre. There is Jack Hawkins talking away briefly with uh, Alec Guinness. And <laughs> Valerie Hobson has also arrived. My word, that's a lovely outfit she's got, especially when she gets onto the, the Kawasaki bike. No, no, it's a Harley Davidson. It's a Harley Davidson. And uh, John Mills is a lovely smile there from Sir John as he gets into his tight black leather and also puts on a rather exciting crash helmet. The sort of crash helmet the stars of the 50s are always wearing a clear cigarette, very lightly in the right hand, have to have upon their heads. But the dresses are very wide for the girls, of course, that very white splayed Doris Day look, but they look rather splendid in it, especially when the crash helmets are on their heads. Superb. 20 points for John Sessions, who'll stay at the microphone for the next game, which is called The Great Debate. Another round called The Great Debate. The contestants are all going to debate a subject, and this is your subject team. It's going to be capital punishment. But now we want um, some names of various characters who could be debating such a subject. I mean, it could be estate agents, megalomaniacs, manic depressives, <laughs> any one of those sort of suggestions. That's all. Psychopaths. Psychopaths. So that's one. We write down psychopaths. We'll, I'll allocate that to one of the people in a moment. Oh, we, we've, we've had a lot of children's presenters, sure, at least salesman. I have. Um, <laughs> insurance salesman. No, we've had, uh, we've had children's <laughs> presentation. <laughs> all, uh, all right. Com <laughs> computer programmers, and one more. Lawyer. Sex therapist. Sex therapist. That's, that's fine. Sex therapist. She said Always... speech, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen, don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. So, um, psychopaths. Well, I think, uh, John Bird, could you be a psychopath? Um, 
could uh, John Sessions be a computer programmer? <laughs> Jimmy, could you, Jimmy Marvel, insurance salesman, representing them. And sex therapists, or, or speech therapists, if you insist upon not getting no, laughs. Sex uh, is fine with my mate. <laughs> just can't get my Stephen tongue around it. It's Stephen Fry. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is get you uh, debating this topic and I'll dodge around amongst you, bringing you in ad lib or at whim or somewhere. Um, it's about capital punishment. It's about capital yes. punishment, yes. People with long memories will remember that. Jimmy, you look as though you want to start this round no, off. No, no, no. So, <laughs> pumping my hand. Foolishly <laughs> clapping your hand together and saying, me, 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 me. So, <laughs> Jimmy Mulville as an insurance salesman starting off the great debate on capital punishment. Well, we, the policy wouldn't actually cover um, death by hanging by the neck, but um, if you could sort of set fire to yourself on the way up the scaffold, then you'd be fully covered for the... Uh... John, Sessions. Well, the Balinese have got a type of disc now, which if you put it in the machine, you can do it for miles away, and then you don't have any of this problem of, you know, black sack on your head or anything like that. You know. John Bird. I think it's entirely wrong that the state should take it upon themselves to end persons' lives. I would quite like to do it personally myself, <laughs> and I think if people... You know, darlings, I hear all the time. <laughs> all this, you know, they, they say to me, you know, about the hanging... Listen, I tell you a secret. <laughs> no, listen, no, it doesn't matter if you're well hung or not. <laughs> John Sessions. You see, if it, you can have it, you can have an, maybe an apple or a wang there, right up on the block, you know, and you can, you can chop the head off. You take the head, you take the basic data that's in the head, you can process it. So even though he's dead, you can use him for all sorts of things. You mean? You mean? And we would actually cover this with the Hangham High policy. Now, this rope that we actually provide with the service is, in fact, very good. It comes in four sizes, and we would recommend that you have the whole family done in one go. <laughs> well, that's, that's a fair enough way of doing it. John Byrne, I, think, I was pointing at. I think that, that hanging is something you ought to be thought about a lot. I think about it a lot, personally. I dream about it. And, uh, in fact, here's my mother. You can just see with the rope marks around her neck. And, uh, poor old dear, but she was, she was a good mother to me. But now she's dead. Uh, <laughs> no, if you want to wrap yourself up in ropes and things, it doesn't matter. All that matters, really, in the end, is that you buy my book. It doesn't matter how. Thank you very much. OK. Well, ten, ten points each there. And we now amazingly come to the last game of the night. <laughs> well, at least for, well, for, well, for my night, anyway. And it's called Commiserations. Now, the idea of this game is that I've just broken up with my long-standing girlfriend. I wouldn't tell my wife, if I were you. And <laughs> the contestants, if I were me, in fact, and the contestants are going to come along with the sort of the worst possible people or the worst possible ways to console me. And they're just going to do that ad-lib as they want just as the fancy takes them. So who don't all rush? <laughs> and I'll award points if I feel like it. Well, Clive, there are plenty more fish in the sea, aren't they? <laughs> Not many more girls, though, but... <laughs> I, mean, I mean, honestly, Clive, I mean, take it from all of us here, she wasn't much good in bed, was she? <laughs> Well, you see, losing a girl, I mean, you know, it's one thing, but if, if you've lost a cat... <laughs> or, um, or, or a pet you're fond of, it's, it's far more important. I mean, you, you, you can't take a girl for a walk, really, can you? You know. I think, I think it's the best thing that's ever, ever happened for you, that, you know, Jane leaving you. I think, at last, you can discover your true sexuality, Clive. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> well, I think she's much better off with me anyway. <laughs> you see, now you can build all the things around the house you are not able to uh, get on with. I mean, but look on the bright side, Clive. I mean, you know, we all agree that for those 14 years, she didn't sweat much for a fat girl. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cut that one out. That's all right. Well, look at it this way. I mean, with so many sexually transmitted diseases about now... Which apparently she had. <laughs> 
Not just apparently, either. <laughs> but the thing you've got to remember is she's gone, okay? You still got your own body. Well, that surprisingly productive round ends our show for tonight. That I'll just give ten points all round apart from to Jimmy Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> Which means... Oh, this is incredibly exciting. This memory is always rather dramatic. Uh, and it means that John Burt has won. So a big round of applause, John Burt. <laughs> and what... What that means is that uh, John Bird will be given the right to read the credits at the end of the show, and we'd like him to read the credits in the manner of a high-up BBC official, perhaps the, the Director-General himself. Well, that's the end of Whose Line Is It Anyway? <laughs> <laughs> so this is me, Clive Anderson, saying good night. Good night. Whose Line Is It Anyway? featured Stephen Fry, John Sessions, John Bird and Jimmy Mulville. In the chair was Clive Anderson. The show was devised and compiled by Mark Levison with the... Well, what's this word? Sorry, the producer, the producer Dan Patterson. He's with a chop. We present Whose Line Is It Anyway? And here is your chairman, Clive Anderson. Hello, hello and welcome to Whose Line Is It Anyway? A radio programme of off-the-cuff inspiration, ad-lib improvisation, extemporisation and perhaps some other readings from Roger's Thesaurus. Well, this is the end of the series, so we all want to go out with a bang, but first we must do the show. As usual... <laughs> We ha As usual, we have participating Stephen Fry, the writer, humorist, and all-round swat, and a rather, a rather stalwart, getting ready even now to wart our stalls, the battler of largs himself, John Sessions. <laughs> our, our two guests are John Glover of Weekending and Spitting Image fame, and finally, a very popular lung impressionist in the tradition of Mike Yarwood and Camille Pissarro, Rory Bremner. <laughs> Right, well, we start with a game called Authors. The contestants are going to take it in turns to tell a story, the title of which will be thrown at them in a moment by the studio audience. They will each tell it in the style of a favourite author they've come along with. Now, Stephen, what, who's your author for this week? Um, the Thousand and One Arabian Nights, Clive. Yes. <laughs> by... Uh, many hands. By many hands. many hands. Many hands. The German author, right. So, The Thousand and One Nights. <laughs> and uh, Rory... I should be doing um, Clive James and bringing a broad stroke of humour to the programme. Jolly good. <laughs> <laughs> and Clive James. And John Glover? Yes, Clive. I shall be doing, um, <laughs> crawling, uh, Mark Twain. Mark Twain, a very good yes. selection. Uh, John. John uh, Sessions. Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on from contestant to contestant when I make this noise like that, with the, using the buzzer. But uh, can we have a title, a suggestion from somebody in the audience who can think of a title? <laughs> The Adventures of Nelly the Elephant. Thank you, sir. Right. Uh, <laughs> the Adventures of Nelly the Elephant. Starting off with Stephen, with your author, was the anonymous author, really, of A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. <laughs> there was a merchant from Isfahal travelling to Basra by way of Baghdad, town of the silver-thighed maidens. <laughs> And as he left that town and headed out towards another second volume of autobiography, that, <laughs> that well-known merchant from the land of Basra, one of those strange exotic places down under which always make good and cheap television series for people like me, <laughs> headed off towards the circus there to meet his doom and a fat chum called Nelly. Gus G. Willikins, Huck. <laughs> How the devil in tarnation are we going to get this elephant on this raft and get her down the Mississippi 
and still keep up this endless flow of dialogue that seems to be the only thing that Mark Twain can write for us. There are no descriptions whatsoever of the wrath. Had Mr. Witch the unmitigated temerity, indeed happiness, indeed hope, to cast his eyes from the window, there below him on the street, moving indeed as if they had indeed been friends of Mr. Wickle and even Mr. Wackle and Mr. Wickle and Mr. Wackle, who of course had been writing the history of Greece for 15 years with a love and happiness not found at this part of Ilchester. They would have seen there before them Nelly the Elephant prancing along, going off to the circus, off to the circus in hard times. The gazelle-eyed, moon-buttocked daughters of Isfahan. <laughs> oh, my beloved. <laughs> no, not on your Nelly, cried the trainer. Japanese, by the way, who'd managed to get Nelly into the circus tent in time for the final show. <laughs> Gosh, gee, Willikins, Huck. <laughs> I sure am glad we managed to get Nelly the Elephant into the tent in time for the final show. Guess I'll have to go and paint Aunt Winstance's white picket fence even wider than it was before, before we get back on the raft, go down the Mississippi, meet some gamblers. Tell me this, said Sykes, his eyes caught in the lemon light of the window pane. What kind of whittles am I warily talking to here? What kinds of whittles am I bringing to this elephant? Is it the whittles that an elephant wants? Leave him alone, said Nancy, and crashed into the floor. And at that very moment, the pachyderm itself, running along from Mr. Whittle, who had himself just that very moment come back from the pocket shop, came in and gave the elephant cream buns, and they all lived happily ever after. Well, we, we end that round there, I think, ten points each, and a bonus of 15 to everybody for mentioning the title in every, every uh, time we got to the story. Very unusual. Right, let's move on to the next game. It's called Genre Option. Um, I'm going to give two players the setting of a scene, and they'll improvise it. At any point, I'll stop them with this sound again. And I'm asking the studio audience here to supply a new film or theatre style, something like a musical or a western or Shakespearean. But, but hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Not Western or musical or Shakespeare, because that's what people always shout out every week. And uh, melodrama, not that either. Um, <laughs> so, it's Stephen and Rory. I'm going to give them a situation first before we give them a style. And your situation is, Stephen, can you be somebody interviewing... Um, well, you're the tax inspector interviewing somebody about his tax returns. Oh, that's the scene you're improvising. Right. And you're interviewing Rory as that person. And we'll give you a style when I buzz. So just start off as, as normal. Right. Um, Mr. Hodgeplaster, do you mind if I come in? Uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, don't uh, mind the ledgers on the left. As you'll see, I've kept records uh, uh, extremely accurately over the last five years. And if you all just mind that, that's the, uh, that's the accountant who, who called last week and um, met a rather unfortunate end, in fact. No, no card, no card, that's good. Yes, no card. This is two, two, <laughs> which I interpret as 22. <laughs> You claim for only 20, darling. Oh, yes, but moonlighting becomes me. <laughs> Another star from over there? James Bond. James Bond, okay, James Bond film. No, I don't know, I don't really do a James Bond, do you? Uh... <laughs> uh, well, it's funny you should ask that. Oh, yes. <laughs> Perhaps if you uh, did your tax returns less and Roger Moore, it might be... Um... <laughs> Well, shave you a bit of money in yes, the long run. It's always the way I have to it's multiply money, penny, by... It's uh, your penny money, in fact. Uh... Point double oh seven is usually the figure that we come to. And, uh, <laughs> but for holding a pen, I generally need a stuntman these days. And... Another one to end on? Film noir. Hang on. Film noir. That's a bit like black and white film, I suppose. Nice. So... You open the book because Thoipe told you to open the book. Why did Thoipe tell you to open the book? Because he knew, he knew that you were going to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning. You fiddled her, darling, and you're going to swing for it. So, there in a clip from a 1936 talk. <laughs> we find the first experience of rapid dialogue. Later, of course, the projectionist managed to slow the film down to half the speed and made more of the words intelligible. However... <laughs> Uh, 
20 points each there, and a bonus of five to Rory for early use of Barry Norman. <laughs> Always gets that bonus. I assume that's who it was. Now, uh, now, John Sessions and John Glover, you've got a situation to do for us, please. Uh, a driving test. Uh, if John Sessions, you can be the tester. You're testing out uh, John Glover as the driver. So if you'd like to improvise that, a bit of conversation going on there. And again, a few more theatre styles, film styles, uh, when we get to it. Disaster movie. Disaster movie. Again, everyone's very early. With it. Go, can start. We'll, start off, we'll start off with disaster movie, then. never mind the boring beginning bit. I'm telling you, this car isn't going to go 25 feet. You're going to be looking at one long, gut-crunching mass of bodies and flame. I haven't done the emergency stop yet. Another star? Vaudeville, vaudeville. OK, Vaudeville. That's, that should be OK. Thank you. I can remember four years ago Sitting right here in the car I got the steering wheel right in my hand It's really rather bizarre It's my driving car Driving My driving Yeah, yeah, another star Japanese monster movie Japanese monster movie <laughs> Does that mean I failed? Another one? Sorry. Melodrama again. The man desperately wants his melodrama. He's not going to stop yelling melodrama unless we do it, so, so do it. Dead, dead, and never called it Mercedes. There she lies. Come on with you. Looks a messy landlord. I only hoped I was about to take my driving test. Surely this carriage can go down the end of the road so I can earn a living in as a We still driver. foul, snivelling swain. Take your turnipy breath out of here before I put you back in the garage. Oh, no, please, sir. One more, one more to end with. No, no, one, one at a time. <laughs> Health education film, that's something. <laughs> Health education film. Look at this steering wheel. Look at that clutch pedal. <laughs> There's germs on them. <laughs> and we know where they come from, don't we? <laughs> Filthy hands. Yes, but luckily, I'm sure you're about to tell me what I can do about that. Yes, I will. Before you put your foot, before you put your foot anywhere near the clutch pedal, or even pedal, <laughs> wash it thoroughly in big bottles of Dettol. <laughs> yes. And what about this other disease I seem to have that does affect my driving rather a lot? Oh, that's being working class. We can't cure you of that. Hang on that. Well, 20 points each there. <laughs> now we're going to do another game called Ads. Yes, so we're going to get Stephen Fry to do an advertisement. He's been practising all his life to do these. Uh, Stephen Fry will be doing an advertisement for... <laughs> underarm deodorant. Uh, but do it in the style suggested by the piece of music which will start playing about now. Because you're lovely, Roadlong have created new blue fritch a new kind of deodorant that goes on working sun ripened californian denim <laughs> from the early morning which the man from del monte has just passed saving the economy of an entire continent direct to you under your arm tonight Definitely 10 points there for using the lines from all the ads you've ever appeared in. And we'll now go on to John Sessions doing another advertisement, an ad for joining the Marines, but in the style suggested by this music. I 
didn't know what I was going to do that summer. <laughs> but he'd gone and I guess you could say I was all alone. <laughs> and then I started painting. I started painting, I started using turquoise and green and ultramarine. <laughs> and I got the idea, why paint soldiers? Why not be one? Yes, very good indeed. 32 points for that. Well, now we switch to John Glover and Rory Bremner doing something slightly different. It's a game called Couples. They're going to start improvising a scene when I press the buzzer, and I want the audience to suggest two other people that they could be as they're continuing the scene. Um, and what we're getting to do is to pretend to be a psychiatrist and their patient, or, and his patient. And we also start off with a couple. A couple of people that might belong together, like Romeo and Juliet, or real people, probably. Cagney and Lacey. <laughs> <laughs> Cagney I'll and Lacey. You any, <laughs> you any other brilliant rat. suggestion from you, and I think you can leave now. But uh, yeah, you start off with Cagney and Lacey, and then we'll move on. Can you do that? Yeah. Yeah, of course you can. Okay, you, uh, you. Uh... I'm going to say, Christine. <laughs> you dirty rat, you. Uh... I come you shot my father. At you. <laughs> I keep thinking I'm stuck in a time warp. <laughs> Maybe a couple of real people. The no, real well, people. That's, <laughs> that, that's close. Anyway. Uh, sorry, no, can we have a proportional vote on that one? I mean, <laughs> because uh, I've got to have something I can ignore later oh, on. Oh, David, um, don't start. No, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but it's, it's plain that we've been suffering for years from this split personality syndrome, and I mean, it certainly oh, seems... Oh, David, that... for goodness sake, you know. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, I was on the couch this morning, you were on the couch this afternoon. Yesterday, it was the same last week, same for week. For God's sake, David, am I paying 15 guineas for this? <laughs> Why don't you both carry on, both doing Robin Day? <laughs> both the psychiatrists and the patient. Well... No, no, sir, not you. I don't want to hear from you at the moment. <laughs> The gentleman no, if there. you're going to continue to interrupt the programme, I'm sorry, we're not going to carry on. I'm afraid not. I, I think we've invented a new game. Let's do both. <laughs> let's do you both doing uh, Frankie Howard. Oh no! <laughs> yes, well, it's uh, uh, no. And then a couple of people, another pair. Sandy Graves, Sandy Gall and Alistair Burnett. That's a good suggestion there from your agent, so go ahead with that. <laughs> it's ten o'clock, here are the main points of the surgery again. <laughs> and we end tonight with a rather whimsical little tale from the palace. <laughs> Apparently, when... I think this is mine, Sandy. <laughs> Even though camera three cut away to Sandy there, it is in fact my own. <laughs> One more pair to, to finish. Saint and Greavesy. Okay. As... We're laughing already, haven't even started yet. <laughs> well, we sent Jimmy down this week to have himself analysed, and I think you got up to a lot of fun down there, didn't you, Jim? Well, it's funny you saying that, Saint, because... Yeah, I, I, it just seemed to me that I drank that sample that I gave you last oh, week and it's done something oh, rotten to my brain. Oh, that's so funny. That's good, Jim. Well, all that... Is... <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, well, uh, ten points each there, I was thinking. A bonus 20 to Rory, just to fiddle the score. Now we come to another game called The Great Debate. All four... Contestants are going to participate in this, and they're going to be debating a subject, which this week I'm going to give it to you now, and it's uh, blood sports. You're debating the topic of blood sports for or anti, but doing it in the style of some types of people, like uh, megalomaniacs or manic depressives or estate agents, that sort of thing, <laughs> that's suggested by the uh, studio audience. Have you got a few sort of types of people that I... Hypochondriacs. Hang, hang on. Uh, <laughs> hypochondriacs, that sounds like a good one there. Can we get that one? Funeral director. Funeral director, yes, that's good. <laughs> Stand-up comedians, yes, yes, that's, that's fine. Um, Frankenstein! It's not a type of a person, really, is it? Well, lots of bits of people all bothered. 
Baby, no, no, I don't like BBC Director. No, obviously, I do like it. Psychopath. Uh, psychopath. Haven't we had... Last week. We had that last week, apparently. In fact, we had a psychopath in here last week. <laughs> <laughs> and he was very popular with the audience. Now, hang on, what's that? A royal. A royal. Well, the royals generally, that would do. So, um, types of people. So, uh, hang on, John, could you do a stand-up comedian, John Sessions? Uh, Rory Bremner, you could do royals, couldn't you? Uh, Stephen, <laughs> Stephen, I'd have thought, uh, funeral director. <laughs> and John Glover, uh, hypochondriac. Thank you very much. So, I think that's... <laughs> Start off, John, now, debating blood sports. You doing your character as whatever it was. Stand-up comedian. Stand-up comedian. You have all Pakistanis. <laughs> 15 foxes and 12 seals, and all sat in the back of a bus. <laughs> an Irishman got in the bus, a Scotsman got in the bus, and a fox hunter got in the bus. Rory. Well, of course, the thing is, is just, if you, once you get the fox to stop, you get a large pair of scissors, and um, all you have to do is just snip one half of the fox away from the other, and it apparently it doesn't hurt a bit, unless you, could do, unless you could do a finger cord and that strange ring at the, the back of the zoo. John Glover. Yeah, I've had that. <laughs> Stephen. It doesn't matter whether the loved one <laughs> is an animal or a human being. If they want to be laid at rest in an expensive fashion, <laughs> then we're here to clear your mind. John Sessions. He comes along and he looks in the hole and he says, This is a foxhole. And man says, If you do it, you'll probably like it, especially if you're a sweet. <laughs> And that was Roy. the funniest royal variety joke I heard in 25 years of doing the programme. But it seemed rather funny to be um, riding on foxes to catch horses. Um, uh, and the whole thing... <laughs> John, John Glover. Don't think I've ever met a raw before. Uh. <laughs> Rory. Um, I must say, uh, you, you do look um, remarkably ill. Uh, have you... Um, have you... Uh. Hot Stephen? Royal purple silk lining for the casket, as we prefer to call it, in which the adored one may rest for eternity to rather unpleasant Yamaha DX7 Hammond organ music. So he says to them all, he says, shall we toss the fox? He says, well, you'll never get it under the grill. Well, I think you all touched on blood sports every now and then, so I think uh, <laughs> ten points each there. <laughs> Let's now do <laughs> improvising a rap. Oh. Very popular game, this. Oh. Everybody loves it. Oh. It's like Christians being thrown to the lions, only they do it to a drumbeat. Now, obviously you need a topic for the rap. <laughs> Hang on, there's five... Soap operas. Soap operas. DIY. DIY. I think DIY is a great suggestion, actually, yes. Yeah, okay, DIY rap. That's it. Starting with John Sessions, the DIY rap. <laughs> DIY is often done by a guy called Brian. Makes naff kind of banisters out of wood and plywood and wrought iron. And now and again, he breaks off and goes to talk to the wife, but most of the time he's happier with a Stanley knife. <laughs> yes. The guy next door is driving me mad He's really all hammering, he really is sad He's trying to build himself a house But the guy just ain't as quiet as a mouse Well, you get yourself a hammer and you get yourself a drill And you save a lot of money on the decorator's bill You can drill all night, you can drill all day And you really save a lot of money that way, you know what I mean, you know? Well, well, uh, oh, yes, um, <laughs> oh, I, I shouldn't wonder. Um, no, uh, DIY is, um, well, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's, um, it's injurious to the health. Um, it stands, for those who are interested, for do it yourself. Um, <laughs> I had, I have a terrible time with all these, uh, all these, um, you know, brackets and fixtures. Um, I, I tried to put a picture on the wall the other day, um, 
<laughs> and essentially, I put, I put the wall on the picture. Um, <laughs> wasn't horribly wrong. <laughs> Chobe Cheka and Desmond Decker. They need a black and decker for the breaker. <laughs> and everyone knows that they like any kind of tool. Go back to be as thin as Marley's ghost on the islands. And finding a rhyme scheme, that's usually the rule. <laughs> well, I went on down to MFI to see if I could find something for I. I couldn't find nothing that would fit together, but now I'm making something out of leather. The guy next door, he's gonna do it a lot faster because he's gonna got himself a huge ghetto blaster. He's got himself the fuses and he's got himself the wires. He's gonna do himself up in electrical fires. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly. I, um, I, <laughs> I, I do a bit of, um, <laughs> bit of, uh, bit of DIY now and again. Um, well, it's a lot cheaper than, you know, the, well, paying the men. Um, I, uh, ha, I, uh, ha, ha, I, uh, I suppose you could call me, uh, you know, something of a self-inflator, but I'm, uh, I did it uh, myself, and I'm a self-made man who worships his own creator. That's one of the better raps we've had there. I think 50 points each and a bonus 50 to John Glover because it actually sounded like a rap both times <laughs> round. You won't be allowed to do it again. But Right. Uh, we're, we're now coming back to the last game of the evening, which is very sad. And this is called Bad Chat-Up Lines. The idea of the game is the contestants must uh, come up with the worst chat-up line in the world. To me, you've got to imagine I'm some gorgeous, pouting, blonde girl. Or what is probably even more difficult, some gorgeous, pouting, blonde man. But... Uh, <laughs> No, probably make it, make it a girl, and just coming out with the, uh, the worst chat-up lines, as and when you, you think of them, just come to the microphone and, and do it. Hi, uh, I'm a regular contestant on Whose Line Is It Anyway? <laughs> Doesn't that work with you, then? <laughs> I managed to put up a shelf the other day, and uh, I don't know if you'd like to come and, and, and look at it, because uh, I've got one mug on it, and I think it looks kind of lonely on, it, on its own. <laughs> Hi. Um, I don't know if you remember me, um, but I was at that party where Jessica's sister was, you know, the one who's going out with Mark. And Mark said to me, well, there's this really fantastic girl living in our flat. Not you. Um, <laughs> hey, sweetheart, come over here. Come over here. I'm never going to bother asking your name because I just call my girlfriend's bitch. <laughs> How about you and me get together, go back home, and form a party? I've got some. <laughs> Bob says if you come back to my full house, opportunity knocks. So, have you ever had lunch at Buckingham Palace or what? Tomorrow could be the end of the world. <laughs> Would you be in any way offended if I said that you seem to me to be in every way the visible personification of absolute perfection? I think, you know, before we get down to bodies, we got to take a long look at our mind. <laughs> All right, we're ending that. Well, there it is. So that ends, that ends that round. It ends the game for this evening. And I just see the scores being totted up. And as we, plan as we uh, see, it's John Glover has won, which is, uh, which is rather exciting. <clears throat> uh, a late run on the outside there doing the rap so well. So as we, well, you know, the prize for winning is to get to read the credits out. Oh, good. 
and you do that in a style which I'll suggest. And why don't you do it like Melvin Bragg? So you, you'll have to do that when all the music comes on. Anyway, that's the end of the show, end of the series. It's all very sad. Uh, that's the end of the show featuring, featuring this week Stephen Fry, John Sessions, Rory Bremner. This is me, Clive Anderson, saying good night. Good night. This line is it anyway, features David Fry, John Sessions, Rory Brabner and John Glover. The show was devised and compiled by Mark Levinson with the producer, Dan Patterson. You're listening to BBC.